that dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. Hebrewway.com, high quality custom Israelite apparel store. The place to find scripture based attire for men, women, and children of all ages. We have a wide range of t shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts, caps, beanies, and bags available in a full range of sizes. Also, the ideal place to find Israelite gifts for family and friends. Hebrewway.com is geared toward awakening men and women and especially the youth worldwide. Try our uniquely crafted collection with free shipping on eligible items. Help spread the word of the Most High. Visit us at Hebrewway.com. That's Hebrewway.com. Peace and greetings to you. This is Amuna Yisrael, affectionately known as the First Lady of Debate Talk for you. I have enjoyed coming to you week after week, you know, season after season, growing together, speaking about the difficult topics, investing the energy, time, and effort with our brothers and sisters on the panel. Today, I would like to come to you with an opportunity for you to invest in something that I've been working on and that's near and dear to me. It's called the Yummy Cottage. You can learn more about it at www.gofundme.com backslash the Yummy Cottage. We're currently fundraising so that we can get it off the ground and your help would be appreciated. Once again, www.gofundme.com backslash the Yummy Cottage. Check the link in the box and hope to hear from you soon. Yo, what's up with it? You are now tuned in to Debate Talk for You. You are tapped into the Men Up segment. I'm your host, B.A. Ben Abraham, and I'm gonna allow the the um I'm gonna allow my our <laughs> our guest host, I mean our co-host, to introduce himself. Yeah, shalom, Mr. Ka. Peace to the family. It's anonymous Hebrew. I want to say all praises to the Most High Yah, Dr. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm just excited to have another great show. Peace to my brother B.A. Peace to the brother Sal. Peace to the brother Yahukanai. And uh, hopefully when we arrive, peace to the brother Kevin G. So let's uh, go ahead and have a good show, and, and let's get it popping. Shalom. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We just been giving word that Kevin G has showed up. He's here. So, uh, but before we get to the callers, or we get before we get to the to our two guests, I'm gonna let everybody know listening the topic today. The topic or the subject matter of this conversation will be the pros and cons of the Hebrew Israelite movement. Again, the pros and cons of the Hebrew Israelite movement, and the reason that uh, I decided to talk about this. It's because I see that the Hebrew Israelite movement overall, it is a growing, strong movement online. Uh, the Internet has been very, very, um, has played a big part in the growth of this movement um, throughout the whole nation and pretty much worldwide. Uh, you're starting to see Hebrew Israelite camps pop up all over the country and even outside the country as well. And it's a beautiful thing. But we have to also be honest. As, um, even though this movement is a force and it's growing, we have our strong points and we have our weaknesses. So um, I decided to bring on Kevin G and Brother Yohokanan because these guys have been in the movement for quite some time. They have, uh, they have spoken out and stated their opinion on the pros and the cons. And I, I thought it would be very powerful to get these brothers on here and to share their opinions of what they see from a constructive from a constructive criticism perspective as we go on as a people or as a nation or as that light we're supposed to be in um showing the image of the most high yeah. and um with that I'm going to fall back and I'm going to allow our callers to uh introduce themselves hello can you hear me yes sir yeah, this is Yehukanan, man. Um, thank you for inviting me on the panel, B.A. Uh, what's up, Anonymous Hebrew? What's up there, Kevin G? Hey, man, that G going to start standing for ghosts, bro. Hey, what's, what's, what's going on there? Uh, hey, could y'all hear me all right? <laughs> yeah, we can yeah, hear, hear you, bro. It's all good. All right, good deal. 
But uh, yeah, and I, I I look forward to uh, sharing my thoughts and opinions, and, and actually listening and learning from you guys, and hearing your thoughts and opinions as well. Shalom. Yes, sir. Kevin G, you want to say something real quick before we get started, my brother? Yeah, just uh, happy to be invited um, to the show. You know, it's been a while since I actually been on the show um, and gave my opinion on everything. And so I appreciate the invite to give a slice of what I know, um, what we can lend to the community, what can, you know, uh, give us the opportunity to actually say what is right and what's wrong and uh, really hash it out. Um, like, I hope this show at the end of the people say, wow, this is very informative or, you know, I agree with what these guys say, or you may say, I don't agree with what these guys may be saying. Um, but I want this to be not a one-sided, although we do identify ourselves as uh, Israelites or Israelite believers or Hebraic understanding of the Bible. But at the same time, I hope that all, the, all of us will take a uh, unbiased approach to actually vet the pros and cons of a uh, Israelite movement. And uh, that's all I'm going to say to my intro. Yes, sir. Thanks again, brother. Appreciate it. Uh, anonymous, man, anything you want to say real quick before we get started? Um, yeah, no, just, you know, I'm excited to have this conversation. I think Brother Kevin G just, <clears throat> excuse me, just brought out some good points um, just about this being an edifying conversation. Um, so the community could could start to hear some of what the pros are, as well as what some of the cons are. Um, There's a lot going on right now. It's like a lot of babies just popping out of shoots and coming into into the knowledge and coming into this way of life. And so I think this is a a very important conversation to have right now in order to start, I guess, giving them some guidance. And I think these two brothers, because they have been in this movement for so long, can bring a lot of – clarity and edification to the to the community so yeah hopefully it's a great conversation and we just go ahead and, and put out some information for the family that's all i got all right yes sir and with that being said when we when you hear the term hebrew israelite there's a lot that comes with that a lot of power a lot of substance um some would say authority so my first question to the brothers, and Anonymous, you can most definitely chime in as well. What are the responsibilities of an Israelite? And I'm going to repeat it again. What are the responsibilities of an Israelite? Because there seems to be a misconception. Some people think it's talking loud on the Internet. Some people think it's acting militant. Some people think it's a bunch of finessing and showing off. But what are the what is the overall responsibility of an Israelite? And especially when they put the term out there, I'm a Hebrew, and I'm yada, yada, yada. You know the brothers and the sisters, they say it with so much umph and so much pride. So uh, any of the brothers can, um, let, let's go with Brother Yehokanon. Go ahead, uh, Brother, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to say this. I think when it comes down to it, as being an Israelite, a lot of responsibility comes with that. I think a lot of people want the want the the fame and the glory and the reward that come with it, but they don't want the response, the true responsibility that come with it. I mean, if you're saying you're an Israelite, <clears throat> first of all, you need to have your life in right standing uh, with Yahuwah, which meaning in having faith in His Son and for His sacrifice that He did for us, and also <clears throat> keeping the commandments is another thing. And once you master that within yourself, then you should be a light to your neighbors, whether it be other Israelites or even those who, who we call Gentiles. So it's, it's our, we're supposed to be the example of righteousness, of walking in righteousness and being righteous, of how to perfectly serve the kingdom. That is our responsibility. It's not just to say, hey, we look down on people and say, yo, well, I'm an Israelite. Well, I'm better than you are. I'm an Israelite. So that just means I'm automatically going to heaven <clears throat> because when we look in Jeremiah he told Jeremiah the prophet that he's going to judge the circumcised with the uncircumcised so that means that there's going to be some Israelites who are going to be condemned right along with the, with the other nations why? because they don't have faith in his word because they're not truly keeping their commandments and if, as we read in Malachi the third chapter it says do not deny a stranger or an alien 
So I think us waking up is a good thing, but then some of us are denying entry for other people based off of genetics and skin color and, and uh, things that maybe their forefathers did that they had nothing to do with. So I, I would say <clears throat> we need to let that go. Let's live how y'all called us to live, and let's be that example. I yield. Man, thank you, uh, Brother Yohokanon. And there's a key word you said, light. And um, after the other brothers are done responding, we're going to touch on that word, light. Uh, so, uh, Brother Kevin G., you back in? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. Uh, did you hear the question? Um, uh, could you go to repeat it for me? I, don't, I dropped out while you were. Okay. It's all good, brother. Um, what are the responsibilities of being an Israelite? Well, According to your knowledge, your understanding. Yeah, yeah. So um, from a universal standpoint, not speaking on uh, from the side of genetics, but really of association of, of one mission. You know what Deuteronomy 6.4 says, it's Israel, hero Israel, our God is one God, right? So that should be the, the, the decree of every Israelite, that they understand that there is one God. And once we understand that there is one God, I had this conversation with Chris Harris. We don't develop a polytheistic mindset as do other religions. And with that polytheistic mindset, when they approach the Bible, they tend to separate the responsibility and the goal throughout the Bible to different people, uh, different things, what this person said, what that person said, such as what Paul wrote. Or people say, well, I don't know about what Paul wrote, but what about what Peter wrote? So if we understood Deuteronomy 6.4 and understand that our God is one God, there should be no contention about what this person wrote or what that person wrote, but there should be an understanding that if you understand what is from God, then you will understand his message even from anybody that he said. And then I would say the most, second most important thing is that I would tag on to what Hukana was talking about is that we should be able, we, are, we should be ministers to all people. I don't care what anybody says. That's just my standpoint for what I study and what I know. We should be ministers to all people, and we should show people what is the true meaning of following the word of God and living out your life the way that it is in Torah to obey his commandment and to understand the testimony of Yeshua, who is the testimony of all the things that we're going through. So um, that's my understanding. Man, man. <laughs> I appreciate that, brother. Most definitely. We uh we most definitely do agree with you on that one. Well, me personally. And Brother Yohokanon, and I also know Anonymous, he stands with that as well. That is some powerful stuff. All right, Anonymous, man, go ahead and let us know what, you, uh, what the Most High has revealed to you. Man, I think both these brothers hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, obviously the first thing is coming back to the truth or what we know to be the Torah. Um, if you can't do that, you're not going to be able to understand any of it. And uh, and then when we do that and combine that with the testimony of Yeshua, I think Brother Kevin G just spoke about it. it. It doesn't, you look beyond, I guess, the quote-unquote differences, or at least you try to. Um, we, you, It's not about arguing about Paul or arguing about this or arguing about that. You clearly see the law. You see these things. You see what we should be doing. So that's the first part is, is really getting a true, clear understanding of the Torah and, and seeing how it relates to the message of Yeshua. And then the second part, like Yehuda and I was talking about, is is living it out. I think for me, the third part overall is, um, I guess, laboring, actually getting out and doing the work. He said being a light, but we have to show the world what that light really looks like. Right, we have to really get out here. That's what's so powerful to me about Deuteronomy thirty, those first ten verses of Deuteronomy thirty, when it's talking about and it shall come to pass when all of these things have come upon you, the blessings and the curses. And then like when you're in the nations and and thou shalt call these things to mind, all that I have commanded you, right? Since we're spread all over the nation, it's like little pockets of of sleeper cells and we're all just waking up. And we should come into this thing um, and, and come to a knowledge of this and then be that light in whatever area we are in. Um, the the thing that was so essential when they came out of Egypt was after those first, I guess, three or four plagues, 
nothing touched Goshen. Like nothing touched it. They was in complete darkness, but Goshen had light. We should be that in the in the little pockets that we are spread around the world. We see darkness coming, and we should start becoming that light in all of these little areas. And the way we do that is to be active. I think we talk about this a lot. BA is Torah is an action, and so for me, it's the action of it. It's the actual doing the work, spending time with the Most High daily, spending time in prayer, spending time meditating on His Word, and then going out. And doing it, however you do it. Not saying everybody, some people are activists, some people are um, personal with their families, but whatever it is, it's the responsibility of something daily. We should wake up daily with the with the idea of reclaiming this world for the kingdom of the Most High. I yield. Amen. Praise the Most High for that. I want to read, uh, I want to land back off Anonymous real quick. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're going to pick it up at verse 19. I call both, and I'm reading from the Greek Septuagint. I call both heaven and earth to witness this day against you. I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose thou life that thou and thy seed may live. To love the Lord thy God, to hearken to his voice, and to cleave to him, for this is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou shouldest dwell upon the land which the Lord swore to thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them. Every Israelite, no matter what you subscribe to or title you subscribe to, every Israelite should adhere to that, what I just read. To choose life and live. What's life? The ways of the Most High. More condensed. The teachings, divine instructions, the Torah, or what the Christian would call the law. And like the brother was just saying, uh, keeping the Torah or observing the law or the Torah, that is an action. And the thing is, is that when you look at it from more of a Hebraic perspective, you see the action of Torah. You see that it's all about how you move, your conduct, because the spirit manifests through action, does it not? Something to think about. Uh, now, with that being said, Brother Yehok and I had brought up a certain word, light. That's crazy how you brought that up, because that was the direction I was going to go. So praise the Most High for that. So what I want to do, I'm going to go to Isaiah 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Now, we are all believers in Yeshua, the Messiah, the Holy One, the only messenger of the Most High, the only true and one anointed. So what we're going to do, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 42. And we're going to read something. And this is something that we, I know for a fact that all of us who believe in the Messiah uh, or who recognize him, who understand, uh, we've all come across this one. And give me a quick moment, because we understand. And I think I think it was Kevin G. He said that we we are supposed to be a witness as well. So I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 42, and verse six. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thy hand and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant. Of the people for a light Of the Gentiles Or a light to the Gentiles So with that being said For us who understand and recognize Or rock with Christ We understand this to be Talking about him To be the light to the Gentiles Because we understand Israel as a nation They they failed, they messed up, they couldn't do it they, they, they willfully and continuously sinned So somebody had to come and show them the example That's why Christ said I am the way, the truth, and the life Nobody get to the Father but by me And what he is saying to us Or what he is teaching is that He is the example His lifestyle, his walk is the blueprint On how to get to the Most High And to do it properly And with that being said uh, let's see where I, where I want to go. When when you are calling, when we call ourselves Hebrews, should Christ be considered the supreme witness in how to do it? Because you have a lot of individuals who believe that they don't have, they don't need to recognize Christ. They don't need to observe what he said or observe what he taught. So, what is everybody's opinion on that? Let's go with our brother Anonymous. Repeat that last part of the question. Uh, uh, the last part of the question, 
We have individuals who believe that Christ should not be considered as a teacher of Torah, or who should not be considered, or his words should not be considered to be adhered or to be take to be a. Uh, what's the word? Hold on for a second. Forgive me. We have people who choose not to recognize Christ and who feel that we should not have to go to him to understand how the Father works or how to walk correct in Torah. So would you do you agree that Christ that there's a other alternative or another way besides Christ? Do you agree with that or no? Yes or no? I mean, we know we know the answer to this, right? This is a no-brainer. But let's uh, let's try to deal with this, I guess, through the scripture. So of course the answer is no, there's no other way. But it's easy to say that um, without trying to qualify it. Israel has always needed a mediator, right? Whether it was Moshe, um, Dawi, whatever prophet or whatever king or whoever you look at, whatever your inspiration is, Jeremiah, Zechariah, there's always been a mediator, somebody that God was dealing with to get the message. Even when the message was coming to Let's say, for instance, when Moses got the message, an angel brought him the message. And that angel was also looked at as Yah. When Jacob wrestled with the angel <clears throat> in order to get his, his namesake, it starts off, you think it's a man, and we find out it's an angel, and then Jacob actually says, I wrestled with God. So there's always been a mediator, and now we know, based upon uh, having a more sure prophecy now, that the son has revealed to us or been been given to us to to be our mediator in these last days. So yeah, there's no there's no way to, to get around that. You can kick against it all you want to, you can try to negate scripture that is said for decades and millennium almost that these verses and these scriptures are messianic, so to speak. Um, but it doesn't change it. It doesn't change the fact that he taught Torah. It doesn't change the fact that he gave prophecy and they came to pass. It doesn't change the fact that those that listened to him actually escaped out of out of that, that storm that came in from Rome, right? So we know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So we have to listen to him because that's what that's what the scripture tells us. Uh, but But to go back to what you were talking about, light, you know, when you think about that word, the Hebraic word is the order. Um, and if you think about when we see it from when it first emerges in Genesis, or when you're just looking at it from, you know, an empirical standpoint, and when you're watching the sunrise, if you ever watch the sunrise, it creeps up and you see it come out a little bit more, a little bit more, and then the next thing you know, it lights up the whole sky. Right? That's what we, we're in that stage right now where we're like creeping over the horizon. And we're getting ready to light up the whole sky if we can just stay on course, stay on track. There's so many people that want to get us off track, and part of getting us off track is taking our eyes off Yeshua, taking our eyes off the Messiah, and, and wanting to give that up because they're calling him an idol or whatever it is. Um, we have to move away from that. And part of that is our job to get more educated on how to explain him better explain his mission better. And then the other part is to pray for our brothers, that those that reject him, that they would see him and come to the truth. And then finally pray for each other that we would stay hard pressed on the task, on the on the mission, on the battlefield, so to speak. So that way we don't fall off and I'll I'll fall back. My man Kevin G, um uh the same question, my brother. Yeah. Um it really goes back to, I mean, the question really is, uh, is it true that through Christ is the only way? Now, we know we, it says in John 14 and 6 that uh, there's no way to the Father but by me. And we understand that there's other avenues that he used in the past to speak to the people. But we also have to understand that it says in Hebrews chapter 1 that God, who has sundry times in a diverse manner, spake to us in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, but hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. So we have to consider what that means. Um, when we go into the law, the Levitical law that is, we understand that the Levites was the municipal power of the Israelites. And when I mean by municipal power, those who understand the word, that means those that orchestrate their governance, meaning like the civil laws, the sheriff's department, the courts, and uh, the police department, uh, civil works, the city works, things of that nature. So that's what we will call municipal powers. So 
when we understand this in death, we understood that when the people were sprinkled with the hyssop branch with the blood and said, all that we, you have said we shall do. See, it was the high priest, the sons of Aaron, and also Moses' his family, which is the Levites, who was the bypass or the, the way that the people were to reconcile themselves or communicate with the Almighty Father within the Holy of Holies. And because that municipality was there, notice I'm using that word, that office of the Levites was the thing that was connecting the people to the Most High. So now, because we understand that, and we go through what Christ had been through from the time that he was baptized by John the Baptist to begin his ministry, just as Moses had washed Aaron and his sons when they had that went to the, the priesthood, to the time where he actually went through and died on the cross to be that one sacrifice, and the veil was rent from top to bottom, and how we read in Hebrews how he is that one that died, that was the testator of the new covenant, and the one that took after the order of Melchizedek, once we understand by Torah his municipal ability and law, we have no choice but to say, any principal person that studies the Bible, to say that he is the one that is our lead to the Most High Father. Because the Levitical priesthood was here on earth, and we had a tabernacle that was either at Mount Sinai, or we had one of the two temples that was built, either the first one by Solomon or the second one by Ezra and Nehemiah. Then we will have a place that we can go to and have an offering or a byway to get to the Father. But we don't. Christ said, he said, in three days I will tear down this temple. One brick will be left upon the other, and I will build it up in three days. He says it took us 40 and six years to build up this temple. Are you telling us that you could break down this temple, build it up in three days? So they laughed at him, but the temple he was talking about was his body. Why? Because Christ was telling them in the mystery that, look, sooner or later, and it's going to be sooner, the municipality of your priesthood is going to be stripped away from you. And what is going to be given it is unto me, which will be on the right hand of the Father, as is noted in the end of Mark. And he says that like this, this is how you will communicate with the Father. So the question I will ask is, by what municipal power are you using to have a way to the Father? But by what priesthood? And if the Levitical priesthood is done away with, as we understand most of Father Yeshua, we know that he is the one that took up that, that way. He is the one after the order of Melchizedek. So by law, legally, he is the way to the Father. That's why he said what he said. He didn't say it out of foolishness or arrogance or because I have the power. He was saying it because of the necessity of the law. Because if you read in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 9, or, or chapters uh, 7, 8, and 9, it actually says verbatim, the Levitical priesthood connected to the offer for us by reasons of death. And because they went into the holies of holies and they were, had the capability of dying, we saw Zechariah, the, the father of John, he went in there and didn't even want to state by the angel what his son's name would be, and his mouth was closed. See how fragile that office was? So that's why Hebrews writer said that, therefore, it is a necessity to have a priest that will last forever, somebody who can stand. Could you imagine getting brake pads or an engine in your car that never runs out? It's able to make the trip without needing rest. So that's why we have, and this describes Christ as being one who's able to offer continually both gifts and sacrifices, but it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4, I believe, verse 10. So the thing about it is is that we shouldn't think that is an arrogant statement for Christ to say that there's no way to the Father but by me, and he is the front door. And, of course, sorry to be long-winded, we can get into other practices and things that either Masons or other people in this new systems get into to try to find that back door into the God body or what is true spirituality and being in God. Temple, Haram, Abyss, and all this other stuff. No, what Christ is saying is, look, you can become the temple if you accept me, and I will be the municipal that will offer on your behalf without any type of brick, without any type of man, or without any type of candle lit. And that's wonderful. And uh, I yield. Man, hey, bro, I would keep it real with you. Much love to you. Praise the most high for that. When you speaking like that, man, Ain't no such thing as being long-winded. That's the word of God. You speak it. Most definitely, man, I got to man up to you on that one, bro. That was powerful. And I will also like to say before we go to Brother Yohokanai, is that notice the whole time when Brother Kevin G. has spoke, he never not one time quoted a scripture or even brought up the fact that Christ was God. That's for, that, those are for those who are stumbling 
um, with, with Christ who, who have a misunderstanding because you have individuals who accuse us of saying he's God. And that is most definitely false. And those who keep believing that, they're not reading the New Testament. And that also goes out to the Christian for those who overly deify Christ who never claimed to be God. Take notice, and, and when you go back and you listen to this in the archive, listen to what my brother just stated to you. And I'm going to fall back. Brother Yohokanine, do your thing. Yes, I was going to say that uh, when we look at Torah and we look at when the priesthood was set up, uh, there was always had to be a high priest to mediate for the atonement of sin for the, for the nation. And this is nothing new. And I believe that the Mashiach is that atonement for the sins, and it's it's nothing new. This is this is in Torah within itself. It is a mandate that there will be a high priest that will atone for the sins of the nations. So through Christ's atonement, we believe Him to be our high priest. So it's well within Scripture. He is that Melchizedek that's prophesied of. I believe that, and I'm pretty sure everybody on this panel uh, do believe that uh, that Yeshua is that Melchizedek that was spoken of. Uh, for those who choose to reject him, that's their choice. But we have reason to believe he is who who the New Testament says he is. Um, and, and Torah says, may things be established by two or three witnesses. So we look at the witness of, of Matthew, who walked with him. Uh, we look at the witness of John, who walked with him. And then we look at the witness of Peter, who walked with him. And then also his brother, uh, James, if I'm not mistaken, that walked with him. So for those who want to reject uh, that he that we say he's not the Mashiach, that, that's, that's on them. You know what I'm saying? The only thing we can do is pray for them that, that Yahuwah reveals to them. Because as we look at the prophecy of Daniel, during that second period of time, before the temple was destroyed, it was prophesied that the Mashiach was supposed to come and that this Mashiach would make atonement. So if it's not Yeshua, then who is this Mashiach that came that, that fulfilled this thing? And with that, I yield. Yes, sir. Praise the Most High in the name of his only anointed messenger known as Yeshua the Christ. Your anonymous, all right, go ahead and hit him with some of that word, though. I'm going to fall back. No, all right. I'm just sitting here. I'm getting all amped. Like, these brothers are doing what they're supposed to do tonight. I'm digging this. All right. I just wanted to, to just kind of add to what Brother Kevin G had brought up about trying to find a different way or a different door. If you go to John 10 and 1, it talks. About, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Right? Just, like, let that marinate for a second. That, like, Yeshua is the door. He is the way that we get through. It's just the same thing, like, they, these brothers are talking about the high priest. Right? If you understand the, the, the order of Melchizedek, when Peter says it, and then we read it in Exodus 19, that we are a royal priesthood, that's the unification of kingship and the priest, right? So the king was the one that was enacting and putting out the orders, but the priest was the mediator for the people. So when Yehuganon was just talking about uh, praying for these people as well, like we should be sending our supplications to the one that we know who was Yeshua that's in the heavenly being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, because that's the only way to get these people, um, get to get them out of that blind state, right? That's part of the responsibility. So yeah, man, like this, this getting good for me. I'm, I'm ready to just sit back and let these brothers go. <laughs> I yield. <laughs> Notice it said you, if, let me read it again. I'm, um, I'm going to read it from the, uh, King James. I'm going to read it from my Greek into New York version and it reads john chapter john 10 chapter i mean john 10 verse 1 getting excited verily verily i say unto you he that enter in not by the door into the sheepfold but climbeth up some other way the same as a thief and a robber now check this out we're gonna go we're gonna go to the intermediate greek version Verily, truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs by another way is a thief and a bandit. 
And when Christ spoke, he spoke with authority. And when he spoke, his words cut, cut deeply. You can read in Matthew chapter 15 and various other spots. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 7 because we're going to get back to the to the responsibilities or to the pros and cons of, the, of, of, of an Israelite. So let's see. We turn to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to pick it up at verse 24. And it reads, Therefore, I'm reading for the King James, Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. There go that word rock. Hmm. And the rain descended, and the flood came, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, not shall be likened unto a foolish man. The word, man, that word is cutting. Which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the, that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. When it came to pass, when Yeshua had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. That key word, authority. See, Christ was a Hebrew Israelite. He was of the stock of Jacob. He came out of the bloodline of David. We understand that. We believe that. He spoke with authority. And like we said earlier, Christ is the way. He is the blueprint. We are to act like him. That's what it means to be a Christian. Notice how it's common, it's common in the, the American Christian or the Greco-Romanized, Westernized Christian. Notice that it's not that common that they act like, this, like, act like the Messiah they claim to love so much. And the, and, the thing, and the thing is that they call him God. So even according to their belief, even if that was accurate, you still don't see that they're acting like that. But that's a whole other conversation. But the point I wanted to make, as a Hebrew... But as an Israelite, it is commonly seen on on YouTube or on the camps locally in our in our communities where we live at that the brothers on the street corners they always speak with loud and the, they speak loud they speak with authority. That's one thing that pulled me in when I was a, when I was a young brother, well still a young brother, but I was younger rather, and um, that was the one thing that pulled me. I never heard brothers speak and teach the scriptures and speak like that with that intensity with that fire. And that is that tends to be a common thing around all brothers who teach that come up out of Israel. So my question is this: Does the fire sometime overtake the substance of being a spiritual? In the, oh, I'm getting tongue tied. I apologize. I'm getting too excited. It's good to have the passion. It's good to have the fire. But does sometime the fire overtake the spiritual? Um, uh, man, how, how should I work that? Please forgive me. I'm going to do it one more time and get it now. I got it. Forgive me, brothers. When brothers put too much in, too much fire or when they speak or they put or when they bring intensity, when the intensity is too high, does it distort the message? Because an Israelite is supposed to be thinking spiritual. And we see the Messiah, Christ himself, he was a spiritual individual as well. So is it good to speak with that fire and intensity or is there a time to turn it off? Let's start, Brother Yehokanai. Okay, repeat your question. You said something about intensity. Yeah, when the brothers, when, when as a Hebrew, it's, it's known that the brothers speak with fire and intensity. They speak with authority. So does that sometimes overshadow the message that's being taught from time to time, if you're supposed to be spiritually minded? No, I, I don't think speaking with authority uh, overshadows it because... I like with that passage you brought up. If you if you understand the passage, you gotta understand the Mashiach Christ. He knew the scriptures, so when he was speaking with authority, he was speaking with knowledge. Now, when the Pharisees would speak about the uh, about the Torah, they spoke from more of an opinionated uh, from an opinionated way. They spoke more from uh, from a from a targum type way, with with a with a with an opinion, with every, like an a council opinion about what the what the Torah was saying, they they was coming up with man made interpretations. But when the Mashiach was 
speaking. He was speaking with divine revelation. So when you have that divine revelation and you're speaking, you know, that does, I don't think it overshadows anything. I think what it does is it brings conviction. I yield. All right, my man, Kevin G, go right ahead. I mean, uh, I get what Yahuka and I are talking about because we brought this up a couple of times. Basically, it comes down to the modern-day apologetic terms like such as exegesis and eisegesis. When you eisegesis a passage, basically you lead it onto your own understanding, what you can gather from either your culture or what you understand to try to interpret what somebody wrote, let's say, like 100 years ago. You're not in their mind to even understand what they were saying. So you have to exegesis the passage, which is you get into what the language is saying, how it's felt out, the cultural context in which it was speaking, and then you can go back and say, this is what the person meant. Now, if we were to go back, man, uh, 20-something, 27, 26 uh, uh, A.D., which had been around the time of Christ's ministry, and we were there. These people were speaking uh, Aramaic, I believe, and, I mean, you got to understand, they understood the culture. They knew what things meant. They knew their own culture, but then you really have to think, okay, so he spoke as though he was there writing it with most, like he was there when it was made. Like nobody talks to – like, if, for instance, let's say you were driving real fast and somebody said, yo, I don't think you should be driving that fast. Well, wh- well how, why you say I shouldn't? And they look and be like, well, I don't see a speed limit sign, but, you know, I see everybody else going 45 and you going 80, so I'm guessing that we shouldn't go that fast. Now, let's say it was a police officer in your car. And he says, do you know by this jurisdiction and this line and this code that after this time you're not supposed to be driving in this lane past 75 miles per hour, especially during the school zone? You're like, dang, this dude's speaking like he's speaking with authority. It's because he understands the context of the law. He understands where he's at, and he knows what he is saying, whereas he's not the person, as you can not said, giving his opinion based on how he feels and what he thinks is going on. So when Christ spoke about the scripture, he didn't speak like, well, what you think about it, or, you know, this is how I feel. He ain't starting nothing like that. He said, as it is written, bam, bam, boom, bam, and that was it. He never gave his opinion on nothing. In fact, multiple times you will see people actually try to test him. Like when they try to get walk up to Christ and they try to trick him, they hand him a denar. They were like, uh, who should we pay taxes to? Should we pay taxes to God or should we pay taxes to Caesar? And he said straight up, whose inscription is on their own coin? He said, well, there you go. Then they try to tell me again. If I had a wife and, and she got – see, they didn't understand. If I had a wife and, and you know, he, he couldn't make children and he died and then she married a brother and then he, they had children and then he died and then she married another brother in the kingdom of heaven, whose child should it be? Like, they didn't even understand what Moses and them was even writing. They're trying to guess and understand it themselves. Christ would be like, he spoke with authority. He didn't speak like, oh, well, let me show you in the scripture. He was like, let me just tell you because I know. In the kingdom of heaven, nobody should have have children. Forever will be like the angels, either marrying or giving into marriage. He didn't speak like we were. He didn't perceive like we did. He spoke like one who, who is the one or communicate with the one. I mean, and that's pretty, pretty much it. How are you? Man, that's yeah, that's powerful. I mean, that, both of you brothers hit it right on the head. And, and just so they know what he's talking about in Matthew 7 and 28 and 29, is that's when it's talking about. It, it says, um, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes, right? He was. He was, he was really just pushing off. He was really just putting it out there and letting them know this is what it is. So uh, to answer the, the first question that Brother B.A. put out, I don't. I don't think that the that the uh, the energy that the brothers are are pushing for um, actually takes away from the message at all, right? And in First Thessalonians, we're told not to quench the spirit and not to despise prophesying. Uh, we are to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good and abstain from all appearance of evil. Like if we stay focused on this thing and just go forward in the spirit that the Most High has put on us, then the message will go forth because, as we know, none of us actually save anybody, right? None of us actually do it. One plant, one water, but the Holy Spirit uh, adds the increase, right? So 
we know that it's just our job to go forward and present the message and present the message in the spirit that the Most High gave us. Now, not everybody speaks with that fire and with that power, but most of us do because we know where we come from. We know what we came out of, and we're grateful for coming out of that situation. So I don't see it taken away from the message at all. Now, what I do see, and we may get to this when we get to the cons, is some people aren't always staying in that word in terms of what they preaching, and Brother Kevin G. brought this up, the difference between exegesis and eisegesis, right, um, when we're dealing with actually crossing that bridge, like actually understanding what, what somebody was writing in 500 B.C., and then trying to relate that to 2018, there's some steps that you have to go through to get there. It's the same thing with language etymology. You're not just going to get to English straight from Hebrew or get to English straight from Aramaic. You have to cross some bridges. You have to cross some etymological. Uh, yeah, why am I tongue tied tonight? You got to cross some language barriers, right? So uh, we have to, one, hold fast to the word, but also go out there and present it, present it with the fire. Because I know for me, it's, it's like fire shut up in my bones. I just want to. Whenever it's, it's time to go, I want to go. I want to put it out there. And I, I know that these brothers are all the same because I've heard you guys. I've heard you guys put the word out. So I, I don't think it takes away from the message. I think it just enhances it. Uh, is Brother B.A. back? Are you back up? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Go ahead. Man. <clears throat> yeah, I had uh, had technical difficulties here with the phone line. So, man, uh if you guys don't mind, uh, can you bring me back up to speed? I apologize for that. Yeah, I'll just run it down Hello? really quick then. Uh, go ahead, Kevin G. You wanted to you want to bring him back up to speed, give him a recap of whatever one said? When, when did you leave out? Uh, right when you were getting ready to start, I believe. Oh, man. All I said was that... Um, that uh, the reason why Christ was speaking with one, as one with authority because he actually understood in context of what was going on. He didn't mess around with uh, he didn't mess around with any language barriers. He didn't have those barriers. He just understood it as it is. That's, that's all. And um, if you allow, I would like to add that uh, I didn't really answer the question on the part of um, if one speaks with fire or with excitement, does that really does that distort the message? I would say if they're speaking the truth, no. But can speaking with fire trick and beguile one as though it is true? It sure can. We see it every mm, Sunday. Yeah. And when we see pastors, they'd be like, you better tell God that it's, it's time today. If you don't tell him it's time today, when are you going to wake up? And then, like, it'd be unbelievable because in some of those cases, the pastor would even tell you to get high and it or for they be making you think in terms of, like, where you at in the hard hierarchy. They make you talk to God as though he's your slave. And I'm like, nah, that's not the way it works, you know. But, I mean, speaking with fire, with this by itself can be a poison and it can be a blessing. I mean, if you play sports, when your coach tells you, we got to go out there and eat these dudes up, and you speak with fire, it, you, it can build you up like, you yeah, know, we got to go out there and win. So speaking with it's not a problem. It's just with a lie. That is something very dangerous, very nice. And um, it can make the truth uh, all the more better. And uh, I get I do agree. I do agree. And let's, let's talk about a con or, or something that is that I really that needs to be addressed. Why is it that it's common for everybody in Israel to be a teacher? Think about that for a minute. This is something I have talked about time after time after time. And no matter how many times we talk about it, it seems like there's an overabundance of 10 to 15 more teachers that just pop up. So why do we have an overabundance of teachers? Why is it that no one wants to sit back and just play a position? Not everybody was meant to teach. We have to be honest here. This is a constructive critique of our movement, of our people, of our nation, or with our belief, whatever you want to call it. Sometimes we go overboard. 
to where we're open to attack from enemies. And as you can see, I don't have to go into the specifics. You know what I'm talking about. So with that being said, why is there an overabundance of teachers? Anybody? Is, let's go with the brother Yohokanah. Okay, my bad. I, was on, I had muted. Uh, what's the question, my brother? Why do we have an overabundance of teachers? Why does everybody in Israel all of a sudden want to start teaching right after being in Israel like for five minutes? I think what it is is a lot of people want to be seen, and people want to make a name for themselves. Um, it's good that people have knowledge. But uh, I think sometimes we we have to sit down. Oh, hold on, hold on for one second. Oh, okay. I think what we have to do is sit down and really, really spend some time with the Almighty. You know what I'm saying? Let's look at the let's look at the Mashiach's life. He was on this earth for 33 years. So for 30 years, he he really you know saying his ministry didn't he didn't do nothing until he turned 30. He spent three years. Those three years had the most powerful impact in in the whole world. And I think what it is is people, they're waking up and they find out they're Israelites and they're, they're seeing a desperation like, oh, this must go out. But I, I think what they need to do is sit down and really study it and, and get to know the Almighty for yourself. And when the Almighty lets you loose and when you know for a fact that it's the Almighty that has called and told you to do something, Watch the impact that your life has on so many people. But to just to, to, to have a desire and just to have a zeal and to do it off of that, uh, I mean, you're not only endangering your soul, you're endangering other people's souls who, who you're teaching. And I, I think what it is is ego and pride. And I think people want to be seen and they, and they want to be the man, you know. And I, I think they need to swallow their pride and let that go. Sit down, study this word. Seek the most high, get divine inspiration and divine influence to do what you're supposed to do. Other than that, stop trying to lead people to you and stop trying to be people's Messiah and, and lead people to the most high and let, let Christ be their Messiah. With that, I yield. Okay. What a fuck in there for that one. <laughs> It's all good. No, I just wanted to say, can you guys hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, we hear you. Out. We hear you. All right, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, I like what your Hoka Nine just said. Just allow, yeah, build a relationship with the Most High. I'm in favor of that. There's a. Uh, there's a beloved of mine. She's real near to me. I love her to death. She says that all the time. Make sure that you spend time with the Father before you go out running your mouth. I mean, she says that all the time. Make sure that you have a good relationship with him as an individual. Uh, and we see Christ, as you can see, that he had a close and personal relationship with the Most High. We see that. So, um, so Brother Kevin, if you don't mind, man, I'm saying question. I mean, uh, you know, I, I pretty much agree with you. Who can I say? There's really not much more I can add to it. Um, I mean, people just – we just need a lot more students to really just pay attention because it's like everybody's their own uh, – like in the example you who can I gave, like I'm trying to think of a real-world example, but this is what I see a lot. I can't really put a name to it. But, like, you'll get stuff like this. Let's say, for instance, you have teacher A. And, like, uh, teacher A will have, like, maybe five people under him. And let's say teacher A is building up those five students, build up to a point where they feel like they know enough. So let's say three of those five students will break off and start their own thing. Well, I don't agree with what my teacher showed me, but I like what he taught me. I'm going to keep that, but I'm going to add this in because this is what I agree with, and it's not what my teacher agrees with. So I'm going to break off from him and I'm going to start my own thing. And then that teacher goes, um, it's kind of like tree evolution. I'm sorry about confusing y'all. But you know how in, in, in secular science they explain that 
how an oak tree turned into a conifer is because the oak tree dropped seeds and then because how those seeds drop, then those seeds sprout trees and then how those seeds drop and then how those seeds uh, uh, sprout. And then it goes on and on and on. Let's say a bird came and carried off this one seed, which is funny because Christ gave an example of the word being spread upon stony ground. Some were picked off by the birds. Some went into good ground and actually brought forth a uh, root. But, you know, the, let's say a seed is carried off by a bird and it goes off to a faraway land and then it's planted into another ground. And that tree will come up, but it's not like the original oak tree. It now became something else. Because its environment has been displaced over and over and over and over and over again. So it's kind of like what we need to do. Let's say, let's, say, let's give this example from a secular scientific point of view. If you wanted to keep oak trees, oak trees, how do you do that? You keep planting the oak tree the same way. The oak tree in the same ground, on the same earth, with the same amount of water, with the same amount of sunlight. When you take that seed from the oak tree and you put it in a different environment, it's going to become a variant of an oak tree. And then that variant of an oak tree eventually is going to spawn off and become a conifer, which is like an evergreen. So sorry to throw all that in there, but what I mean by that is when you take it in a human perspective, like, that's how we are as students. And we need to stop that, I think, because, like, we'll, we'll go up under a teacher, we'll grow right up under him. And then as soon as we don't dis- we disagree with something they don't like, we don't stick with it. We're ready to go off and start our own thing. That's why you got this group and that group and this group and that, um, uh, 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 what do you call them, uh, denominations, Christian denominations. You got so many of them, I mean, out there because, again, the seeds didn't like where they were planted and they wanted to go elsewhere. Um, so I think from the Israelite perspective, this is why I advocate, that we form a community and, and put leaders that are the best in their field in front of us and copy and emulate them instead of to try to come our own scholars. It's like Ron Devon Prospect, I love what he's doing from a scholarly perspective. I think that everybody else is doing scholarly work from an Israelite perspective. I respect them, but I think that we need to have some type of peer review process so that we can say nobody can come up, no offense to Garfield, and say, well, Ron Devon Prospect doesn't agree with that, and they try to use that against another Israelite, whereas if we all vet ourselves and had a peer review process, we could say we as a community came to this conclusion. You can't point to another tree. You can only point to this one oak tree. Does that make sense? So um, I think that a lot of spreading is bad because it can get us into a place where we're so divided and then, and it, when, and of course, going back to the scientific thing, when something is so divided, it's so spread out, it's no longer compatible. You can't put an orange back on an apple tree. You can't do that. It's not compatible anymore. So we need to stay compatible. We need to stay grounded in the same earth. And we need to grow alike so that we can be strong alike. And uh, I yield. Well, thanks, brother. Appreciate that. Uh, anonymous, man. Go ahead, I- yeah, I don't got much to add because, I mean, the brothers covered um, most of my points. I guess I would just, I would address where I think it stems from and then tie all the points together. So you and I was talking about people wanting attention, and then Brother Kevin G was talking about basically having some type of cohesive leadership council that can vet people before they come out and just start teaching some of this stuff. All of this stuff comes from trauma and what has happened to us over the course of, generation after generation of being starved out and not having a voice. So one of the things that happens when you find out that you are an Israelite is you you go through the anger part of, oh, I can't believe I didn't know this and people hid it from me. And then you get on this, I want to tell the world or I want to go out and I want to do all of this stuff. And, and even if you sit under a teacher, like the brothers talk about, and then all of a sudden you want to get out and do your own thing or whatever the situation is, um, all of that stems from, being starved out, right? You've been stifled for so long, so now it's like I got a voice. I want to use it. I want to just go out and, and, and tell everybody something when what really should happen is we should have some form of leadership, some form of counsel that says, like, you know, this is our cohesive unit. This is how we teach the scripture. This is how we um, go through and, and really uh, expound to the to the world. And you can put your spin on it if you are ready and qualified, but it still needs to line up 
within an overall message and an overall uh, perspective. And so if we're not going to be able to do that, then we will. We'll continue to see these, I guess, various Israelite denominations. If you think about all of the different camps, they're unified in a lot of stuff, but they all have one or two little twists, one or two, maybe in three or four little things that they're different about. So it is, it's important from what I, what I, my perspective and what I talk to everybody about, especially behind the scenes is trying to create some form of a cohesive leadership council, not to invoke rules or to just stifle people, but to properly teach, to, to, to vet, people when they're trying to put stuff out where we can go back to them from a scholarly perspective and say, look, you know, you're missing these things, this part, you know, this is what it reads in the Hebrew. It's important to understand the Hebrew. It's important to understand the Greek. It's important to understand how to put these things together cohesively. So um, overall, I think everybody hit, hit the nail on the head in terms of these people want attention and they don't have a real uh, head, so to speak, a leadership to look to. And, and until that happens, I think you'll continue to see that pattern. You'll continue to see this, this pattern of people just popping up wanting to be teachers, not you. You there, Rock? Yeah, my yeah. fault. I'm sorry. I'm, my fault. I'm sorry. My fault. Okay. Yeah, my, my phone was muted. I started talking and forgot I was muted. Uh, but some good stuff you guys brought out. I most definitely would like to, uh, let's see. Give me one quick second. Uh, hold on for a minute. Oh, wow. Okay. For those who are listening on a live stream, you can call in. The phone number is 319-527-6239. Again, 319-527-6239. 319-527-6239. If you would like to email questions, comments, or observations, the other email is debatetalkforyou4, letter U, at gmail.com. Again, debatetalkforyou, the letter U, at gmail.com. And, uh, and then just to get back into the conversation. Uh, I also noticed there's also another kind or uh, another negative or maybe a disadvantage uh, or strike this against the movement. The spirit of drama. Drama sells amongst humanity, period. But for some reason, when it comes to our people, we love drama. We love tension. We love to stir up the pot. We love to keep the beef cooking. That's a term they use out there in Oakland, out there in the Bay Area. But uh, <laughs> why? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But the thing is, I tend to notice. I noticed that a lot. Why is the drama, why is beef always tend to cook it, to cook, especially in Israel? If we are supposed to present ourselves as a holy, humble, just, and all these and all these type of powerful words that we like to use to explain ourselves, why is drama always in the midst of Israel? Let's go, uh, Anonymous. You know, this is something we talk a lot about you know, behind the scenes. And from my perspective, and, uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't been active in this community as long as the other brothers. But from what I see is it's a serious lack of understanding, keeping or reading reading the text, um, and adhering to it. I think we read in Proverbs where it talks about not, not putting wood on the fire, like basically um trying your best not to keep things going. Um right, this 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 uh need to always be involved in drama and always be involved with some type of altercation. That's what we get from the world, right? You see that on TV, especially if you're watching reality TV shows. Uh, somebody's always fighting or somebody's always got a problem with somebody. Uh, even in movies, right, the drama, the suspense is it, it's, it's what keeps people intrigued. Part of being a wiser nation is learning how to pull back and run away from those things, right, not even wanting to be involved with those things. If there's a problem, Matthew 18 tells us exactly how to deal with it. I've noticed just in my short experience, people are not keen to doing that. No, we're supposed to rebuke. We, I need to rebuke you. I need to, uh, we need to sit down and talk, right? Maybe there's a misunderstanding. Maybe there's a, you know, something we can do 
to, to figure it out before it goes all out public, right? I'm huge on trying to make sure that we are not acting a fool in front of the suppressor. We need to be much more unified in our thoughts. And the way that that happens is understanding the text. The text does not call for us just to publicly uh, berate someone. Now, if people are just out of control, then yeah, you know, there's a way to deal with it. But for the most part, this this uh, this drama that's in our community, especially, stems from us not not adhering to the text. I won't say not reading it. I know a lot of us read it. It's just a lot of people are not adhering to the text. Like we say we love the Most High. We say that Yeshua is the Master Teacher. He is the Messiah. He he is uh, the one that we try to emulate. But our actions don't prove it. And I'll say our just as a community, right? I'm not out here touching people out or nothing like that. But it's uh, just just to show that we need to be a community, right? We if 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 our goal is to really build this thing up and take it to where it needs to be. We have to adhere to the text, and the text does not call for us to just always be involved with drama, always be involved with some type of altercation, right? You cannot always be involved with altercation, right? If that's your life, you got to really step back and do some self-evaluation. This text, this this belief, this lifestyle is supposed to change you at your core, and if that's the case, you, you're not going to want to do those things anymore, so... I'll yield at that. I may come back in. I know these brothers got some powerful things to say about that. All right, brother Kevin, um, you can go right ahead. Man, <laughs> I think we just love drama because we just like that, man. Um, it's something that's just been, I mean, in our community for a long time. I mean, you know, I mean, from what I can remember, when I was little, like the, the whole neighborhood was just full of drama. And you know how, like, your mom and your aunties and stuff, they'll gather around and they'll talk about what's going on in town, who's doing what, who's doing who, this, that, and the other. But I think it happens in other communities, too, and other people of other races and stuff. Um, I think with us, I think we find it more so entertaining than anything. Like, uh, I don't know, and I can't really put a finger on it, man. I'm not a psychologist. I don't know why. Uh, we're into that. We just are. We just into it like real hard. Um, and um, I really don't know what to recommend for it actually. Um, the only thing I can say is that when you don't have a good focus on what you're supposed to be doing and your responsibility, this pretty much the Bible does say don't don't be a busybody. If we have a focus on what we need to do, we wouldn't be doing it. Like if you if your focus was on raising your family. Uh, taking care and saving your marriage, taking care of and, and, and raising your kids, educating your kids, taking care of your finances. Um, when you get locked in that, I really don't see how you could have time to really be meddling or wanting to hear drama from anybody else. Um, but I, I really don't have an answer for it. But then again, there's people that like to listen to it. Like, uh, I hate to bring them up, no, no offense to them, but you have some of the apologists uh, or apologetic groups uh, drama. And it's like, it's one thing that I've noticed, and I, I said to some of my friends, and uh, I said, you know what's interesting? I said, notice that every single altercation or every single conversation between either this group who people are calling apologists, which I think is a false term anyway, because apologists just simply mean in defense of. So if you're coming at me and I'm defending what I believe, I'm by definition an apologist. I'm being apologetic for what it is that I stand for. So we shouldn't use that term to even identify a group in the first place. When it's really the Israelites who are the ones being more so apologists because they're the ones being vetted. It's not the other way around. But getting back to my point, um, I noticed that every everything is really surrounding drama. Like, Man, I hate to bring this up, and, and I hope nobody from there called and try to clear the air because I really don't care about clearing the air. I'm, I'm making an example based on what happened in history. Like, we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. We shouldn't go back and try to explain it happened. So what I'm saying is this. There was an altercation where a man named G-Man was kicked out of his group. When he was kicked out of his group, that started a drama. Then it involved another group, and then those groups started going together. And then everything just spawned out of that one festering wound. 
And it was like, man, nothing could be started or nothing could be done or nothing could, no interaction could happen unless it's some type of altercation or some type of hatred or some type of drama or something between the two people. Like, you don't see anything where people want to professionally approach someone, have questions answered, and vet the information properly. And I hate to say his name again, but then again, I love to because I, I, I really do appreciate what the brother's doing. Is one of those dudes. Like, he's out there. Like, he's actually like, let's approach it scholarly. Let's look for autographed copies. Let's look at the evidence. Let's look at how the language is spoken. Let's look at the Greek. Look at the Hebrew. Let's actually vet this uh, uh, scholarly. And nobody comes up for nothing. Nobody comes up for any type of conversation. Zion Lex approached him, and it was a beautiful dialogue between the two. And it was like, I've never seen anybody from those two opposing groups, meaning the apologists and the Israelites, have that type of approach. They argue and they, they fight and they, 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 they have these bickering matches, but not that nice, I hate to say it, PBS <laughs> type of conversation where they just talking, vetting the information, and that's it. I, I don't see that. So, of course, the only way for them to get attention and to do whatever they do, and I'm talking on both sides, is to start drama. And I haven't even been paying attention to that lately. Like, anytime I see something with that, I really don't watch it. I don't pay no attention to it. Um, and, and that's all I got to say about it. Uh, in my conclusion, I say I don't know why, but they say flies are attracted to crap. So that's it. Whoa. Most death, most death. All right, brother, you're hoping that go ahead. Do you say that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, flies are mostly attracted to feces. Uh, y'all can hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think what it is is it's, it's too much emotion involved. You know, on our, on both sides, you you have uh, you have the Israelites coming in, some not all come in a hostile way. They feel they're angry, they're mad, they feel like they've been deceived. Then you have you know the uh, the Christians, you know they've been believing in what they've been believing in, and it's been passed down from. Generation to generation, so I'm pretty sure they're upset because they feel like you, you're coming against my grandmother's religion. And it's like, you know, if you're standing on truth, ain't no need to get all emotional and stuff. I mean, be cordial. Let them say what they got to say. Let them get their points out. And then, you know, after you finish hearing them, then rebut what they have to say. But it becomes some kind of shout match. Uh, emotions get involved, people start over-talking each other, and, and it just becomes fruitless. And, and that's why I decided not to even pay uh, pay the uh, Christian apologists any attention because, um, you know, I understand where they're coming from. Yeah, you know, you might see some of these, some of these uh, camps or some of these groups have destroyed families. There have been some victims, you know, saying as far as Christian women who have been victims. There's even been our own sisters, Israelites, who women who've been victims. And I understand that. You know what I'm saying? If you're trying to help, you know, restore families and, and, and comfort people who've been emotionally damaged. But when you um when you go ahead and you, 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 you're supposed to be following Christ and you're causing drama, whether Israelite or Christian, I mean if you're a believer, they they ain't what you're supposed to be doing. You you're not supposed to be out here bickering and arguing with people. I mean it's a if there's a right way to sit down and say, hey, you know what? Like like Kevin G said, hey, look here, we don't agree. So let's 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 vet the information, and, and and maybe we can learn something just built off the information, because that person has information and the other person has information, and then you just let whoever hearing it decide for themselves. But lately, things have become a slander contest. Okay, you know you got uh, this camp. Slandering that that apologetics, and then the apologetics come back and the slander. It, it's become like a Jerry Springer show. So the, our bottom line is: look, if you believe what you are teaching, then go ahead and teach it. Teach it righteously. Uh, teach it without drama. I yield. And let me just oh, say this. Hey, hey, oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna. <laughs> you go ahead. Right, go ahead. Oh, no, I just wanted to add real quick. I just wanted to add real quick. Um, because part of what Brother Yehuganon, this is anonymous Hebrew, part of what Brother Yehuganon had just brought up, I think we kind of 
uh, we overlook it, right? He said, you know, there have been some families destroyed or stuff like that. But um, I, I think what we tend to forget, especially when we get over our issues, is that a lot of people still haven't gotten over those issues. You know, we're dealing with people who have been, um, some people have been molested. Some people have had uh, divorces. Some people have grew up in these these crazy environments that I call basically just gladiator camps. Like, there is so much that has happened to our community that um, psychologically that this this is what we get. This is what we see. Um, this is what I, you know, I go to school for this. This is what I do. This is what you're going to get if you continue not to set up a leadership council. That's the reason. That's the need for the leadership council because – now we would have people in, in place to do the counseling, to do the work, to help people get out of, of these aggressive states. Because that's what we're looking at. This, these are just some of it is passive aggressiveness, some of it is uh, extreme forms of aggression. Um, but however, however you look at it, that's what we're dealing with, right? It, and since you can't do it physically, what do you do? You go on the internet and, and you continue to to press in that in that way. So it is important to read the text to take the text to heart, to take the Old Testament, the New Testament, however you want to word it, take these things to heart because that thing that, that, thing that happens is that belief will shape your character, right? It, it, will, it will create the, the, the positive habits that are needed to come out of these things because what we're looking at is a society or a community, if, if we're looking strictly at Israel, a, a community that has been traumatized. And if we, if we don't do something about it, then the things that we see, and it's already happened, it becomes the norm. That's what the NBA talk about all the time is getting that, getting that N-word out of Israel. Uh, and I'll you. Anybody else have something to say? Um, I, I just wanted to say on the other side of that, we also see that there are manipulators of the drama, right? Like you just asked the question, um, I have watched people like, and then it's like, okay, we can't really explain it. Like, I couldn't really explain it. You can I really, he didn't really know. We just saw. But then there are those who do know. Not they, not that they know, like, oh, I know why they love drama. It's like, they themselves don't know why, but they know it works for them. Like, let's say, for instance, they do some YouTube videos, and, like, it doesn't really get a lot of views. Like, it get, like, 100 views. It's not getting their usual 400 500, 700 views like they normally get. But they noticed that they got those views when they were in contention with somebody or they have an issue with somebody. So they recognize that and then what they do is they either ignorantly cause the drama. In other words, like they see it coming but they let it happen because they know it will benefit them or they purposely cause the drama, meaning that uh, you know, they, they go out there and actually call somebody out or say something or do something to somebody just to make that come out. Now, notice, I want all of y'all to be witnesses. I said no names as far as who causes the drama and this, that, and the other. I pointed out a, a historical reference as how it was used, but I didn't call out anybody as though they habitually does that. So if someone wants to call up and say, no, I don't do that, then you need to really examine yourself and say, well, why did you even feel that you were in that category? But my thing is that I think, I think going forward, if anybody listens who has a YouTube channel, don't try to use drama to bring views. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep teaching and keep doing you. Keep teaching as the most high instructor you to teach. But don't get out there and try to pick names just so you can get views. Because when you do that, you really have to ask yourself, Are you, is the Lord supposed to bring people to you? And that you're supposed to plant and another is supposed to water and it's God that gives the increase? Or are you out there trying to do the whole gardening yourself? So I yield. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, brother. Um, there are some habitual offenders out there on their YouTube channel that, have, that love to have people's names in their mouth. And uh, I, I, I do agree with you that if there's a way to teach, no matter what you what you believe, there's a way to teach without having all of that drama. Uh, is Brother B.A. back, Sal? I'm yeah, I'm back, bro. I'm back. All right, go ahead and get it out. 
And, and the thing is, is that it's starting to become a, a major problem. People are starting to walk away from this faith. There are people who watch these guys on YouTube and on social media, and all they see is the folly. Um, the religious establishment on the Internet is powerful. It's a powerful tool, and it's a good tool to bring people to the Most High. But it's starting to become, it's starting to become the Christian-slash-Hebrew version of world star hip-hop. It's getting bad. It's getting to a point to where it's nothing but all-out entertainment. People should not come to the Word of God or representatives of the Word through the form of drama. That is totally contrary to how we're supposed to walk, especially those who call themselves Israelites or Christians. That is totally contrary. But, Sal, I uh, want to see. We got any callers? Uh, yes, we do. Let's go to the phone lines. If I don't listen on social media, the number is 319 when you call, you got to press number one. That lets me know that you want to ask a question or a comment. Uh, for those that are new to the show, remember, when you call, you got to keep it clean, keep it professional. Let's go to 563-210. Live. Five six three two one zero. Are you there? All right, five six three two one zero. Go on once. Going twice. All right, we'd have to come back to that caller. All right, again, family numbers three one nine five two seven six two three nine. If you're already on the phone line, simply press number one. Call us. All right, man. Was kind of looking forward to that caller, see what they was gonna to bring to the table. But most high willing, we get a chance to hear that caller out. Um, all the stuff that you guys have brought out so far, man, speaks volumes. Good stuff to hold on to and to marinate on, and to glean from. I'm serious. And with that, let's see. Now let's 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 see how we can pick this up and keep it going because the rotation is going real smooth. Is there anything anybody on this panel most definitely see? What what's the improvements that you have seen so far up to this day? We know about the pros and the cons. We know about some things that we've done well. We know some things that we need to – we also know about the things we need to improve on. What are the improvements that you guys have seen over the last couple of years or recent months or in recent um, – or recently? Now let's go with Brother Yohokanai. Brother You know, I've um, seen – you know, just people just waking up and becoming conscious, conscious, period, you know. You know, just know what's going on and looking looking throughout history, you know, um, getting better with their scholarship, you know, bringing out information because, you know, a lot of it, the Internet has gotten watered down, I think, within the last eight years. And so you really need old books like back in the 12 and 11 and 13 and 1400s. And I'm starting to see people, you know, come with these books, you know, reading these books and, and getting access to some of these old books that have um, a lot of information and bringing up some of these old maps. So I like how some of the people's the scholarships are improving and how they're digging in for themselves. I yield. Well, go right ahead, uh, Kevin G. Um, I think that... Uh has improved the community greatly because it, it ran the people callous. Like, uh, for instance, like, you know how this whole thing got started? Like, let's, let's keep in mind of everything that was asked, right? We asked the question about Christ and his demand. Is he the one? Then we asked the question about what does it mean about different teachers and is it good to keep the teacher that you have? And then we talked about drama and, you know, some of those other things. And notice that all it is has really been the topic that have ran the Israelite community callous. And what I mean by that is before, what I noticed, let's say back in 2014, the Israelite community was like, they would grab a hot mug and they would move their hand away like, ah, that was hot. And then we repeatedly kept touching that mug, kept touching that mug, and the mugs were getting hotter. And then now we ran our hands so tough and so callous that we pick up the mug and we drink from it now. 
And I noticed that because before, remember back then it was like, oh, Israelites are spooky. They this, they that. That's no longer really being said now. I mean, what, the, what people are saying now is like, I mean, we got some people in our community that's just like, like straight fire. I mean, like they know they stuff like crazy. I mean, serious research on Hebrew, serious research on, on Greek, serious understanding. I'm glad, like think about the situation that happened a couple of years ago. We had Kim in on trial, right? And then that thing, it really introduced younger people who are of the biblical faith, Israelites, Christians alike, to be familiarized with other cultures. Oh, snap, we know nothing about Babylon. Let's get, let's get with that. Oh, snap, we know nothing about Egypt. Let's get with that. We know nothing about the Levant. Let's study that. Let's study Africa. Let's study West Africa. Oh, you're not Israelite. Prove that you're an Israelite. It caused people to actually study African history. And they got into who the who the who the uh, all your Yoruba are, who the people of the Hausa states, but how they came to Fazan, the Yemen, studying Yemen, studying Lake Chad region, uh, West African, the Bantu expansion down into South Africa, the Congo. I mean, we expanded our knowledge. Oh, King James ain't a black man. I'm not saying I agree with that, but let's just think about the question for a second. The challenge itself made us dive into European history. Let's study the Isaac. Let's, let's study the, uh, the Anglo-Saxons. Let's study this. Let's study that. Or let's prove that King James is, is, is a black man or a white man. Regardless if that argument worked out for us or not, because of the types of arguments and challenges that are coming up, whether they're from ridiculousness or from serious claims, it made us go deep to study more. Now, and I'm going to be real with you, you could talk to the average Israelite now. I'm telling you, anybody on YouTube, a Hangout, or on Facebook, they know about Kemet. They know about the Middle Nature. They know about the Middle East. They know about Native Americans. They know about the Anglo Saxons. They know about African history. They know about uh, the Asian culture. They know about masonry. You're dealing with a different beast now. So, regardless of the move and everything they tried, they tried to do to checkmate Bible believers, they ran callous and they are tough. They could pick up the hottest mug and start drinking from it. You got Ron Divine Prosper. You got Zion Lex. Man, the community is crazy right now. So, yes, yeah, I say that foolishness has happened. But like it says in the Bible, all things that are foolishness work out for God, right? The foolish things of this world confound the wise. All of the foolishness that they perceive that Israelites have and Bible believers have backfired on them because now everybody's privy to what's going on. I yield the mic. I agree with you, bro. I have noticed the growth of information. And one thing I will say, uh, when the Hebrew War Machine was, uh, when they first, when they, when they got off the ground and when they were known on the Internet, um, that brought, that's what brought in this extra, um, this extra, uh, those extra topics and those extra uh, cultures that the Israelite brothers were reading and soaking up like a sponge. The Hebrew War Machine had brought that to the table, to where you had other brothers who studied Kemet or other brothers who studied Sumerian knowledge, the uh, the, um, the knowledge of the, of the Sumerian empires and other uh, Canaanite or African empires of that nature. It was it was the it was that it was that zeal to want to study more because guess what we had an enemy. The commissions, and one thing I will say about the commissions, the commissions had stepped it up. They pretty much was like, "Look, we want to bring you out the Bible. We want to see your scholarship." So there's nothing wrong with scholarship, because I mean, I'm not the best scholar at all. I mean, I'm I'm a basic Bible reader, and I and I study political science and things of that nature, and I, and I may go off into other other topics, but that's where I'm grounded at. That's where I. That's why. That's my. That's why I'm in, and in, in, in when it comes to the political, social perspective of things. But it's good to be well-rounded and to have and to be key, or to be able to speak on other uh, topics or other subject matters concerning history, religion, politics, and, and etc. But uh, brother, now let's go right ahead. Man, y'all brothers, y'all y'all brothers said it all, man. You know what I'm saying? Not really much to add. I would just say um, the willingness to cross reference with each other. So while one may, one person may be good at political science, another person may be good in psychology, another person may be good in the language. You now seeing people on Google Hangouts and doing things, all types of different things, reaching out, working with people that they probably never would have spoken with, probably never would have uh, engaged with, 
in order to to sharpen their sword. So I, I think that's the improvement we see, that just the willingness to improve and and, and cross reference and to uh, and to grow in in all areas. I yeah. Yeah, most definitely, man. Um, it's most definitely a blessing. Um, so Sal, we got uh, we got any more callers? Sal? Right. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yep. No, Go ahead. No All right. We did have somebody press number one, but they pressed number one again. Again, family, if you have any questions, you got to press number one. One time, <laughs> if you press them more than once, it's going to take you off the switchboard. All right, we got them. Uh, 563210, you're live. How you doing, Sal? All right. I was just listening to the uh, conversation, and, uh, and I like to say that it's good to see that brothers is trying to be well rounded in knowledge instead of what we done had back in the days where we just had a lot of conflict and issues amongst each other because. Back then, we didn't do nothing but bang, you know what I'm saying? So now we're coming into a different line, right? But the thing is, what I, I see what with Israel and other scholars, as the thing is, like we said, we don't have no structure. And the thing is, without structure, there's, there's no type of organization with our people. Because the thing is, and most of the things why I hear with Christians, they said the law is done away with. Do you know that when you read the, the laws within from Genesis to Deuteronomy, God tells you how to deal with your people accordingly in a well civil and productive manner? And this is what we lose out when people say that the law is done away with. We got laws like, check this out, when you see laws it says, stolen property must be returned to, or, uh, to owner, Leviticus 6.25. It tells you about restoring a place for a loan to its owner, Deuteronomy 24, 12, and 3. We got some people that treat their people like they just, you know what I'm saying, like they just ain't nobody. And the law tells you how we're supposed to deal with each other. So when you say that the law is done away with, we have no structure with each other. We have no organization with one another. We don't know how to talk to each other. We don't know how to communicate. So this is why we say, well, we try to learn uh the laws and statutes and commandments are the most high because he tell us how to reference each other as a people and build each other up as a nation, us coming together. So I just say without the law, we ain't going to never have no structure. You know what I'm saying? And this is my thing is like what I'm learning. I say, well, you have, have brothers that will come up on a uh, line and be more uh, – outrageous with the slander words and mock other people, this and that, because the thing is, like I say, you we don't give each other that respect. God shows us how to deal with one another. But the thing is, like you said, when we see up in, in this world today, we still trying to get it together because, see, you have to understand there's been 400 years of oppression. We haven't had no, no, balance, no structure with one another. We haven't known how to talk to each other. And this is what we're trying to get to the understanding that God said he gave us a heritage on how to deal with each other as a people. So the only thing I'm just saying, without the law, we always going to be unbalanced. You know what I'm saying? It ain't going to never be no organization with us without the law. And that's all I want to say, brother. Hey, this brother weed up, right? Yeah. Shalom, Mark. Shalom. Um, I just wanted to ask you real quick because you – you had spoke about uh, structure. So yeah. I wanted to ask you real quick uh, from your standpoint, because I know you said you're growing. And, you know, I've listened to you a few times on the platform. You said you're doing the best you can to grow. What are some things that you need to see or that you would like to see in the community that would help you feel like you have more structure? The thing is, uh, us coming together, knowing how to talk and be more civil with one another. You see what I'm saying? Like you said, without all the ruckus, the uh, the fussing and the fighting and the argument to be able to deal with each other on a civil on a civil manner. We could sit and talk to each other and try to come to a common ground of understanding what the word is about. I think it, it that's a good start from there. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to get some type of uh uh communication with each other and build from there then then once you start building from there then we start balancing each other out with unity. But we got to first and start with communication, be able to talk to each other in a civil manner. 
That's what I think. That's what's up. I appreciate that. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, most definitely. We appreciate your words, bro. Most definitely. You said some things that stood out. Communication is very key. I think at times um, we we forget the simple things. Communication should be something that all Israelites uh, should have. They should be able to uh, communicate, uh, especially, I mean, communicate properly with their own people, if anything, their own people, and to uh, those outside because we have to bring people to the most high. So communication should be something that we should be, if we're not, if we're, if our communication skills are not up to par, then we need to make sure that we work on getting them up to par. If we're going to be speaking in the name of the Most High, Sal, we got any more callers? Uh, yeah. Let's go to four four three eight one five live. Uh, yeah, brothers, this is Brother Mercy. Hello, how you doing? Brother Shalom. Mercy. Hey, what's going yeah. on, Brother Mercy? What's the word? <laughs> hey, I'm going to say something real quick, brothers. Uh, I'm going to say something, and I really want you to think about what I'm saying. You know, when you think about the congressmen, the House of Representatives, and the, and the senators and the governors, man, the problem with our people, man, we got too much religion. You know, when the congressmen come together, they're not coming together to open up the Bible. They're they talking about writing bills and, and changing law to help the, the, the larger community, the nation. And this is what we need. We need options, man. We need an option, like, so that we don't have to go to Walmart. What if we had our own store we could shop from that we don't have to use the white man for a lot of stuff? You know, we should be doing business with each other, coming up with bills with each other, and uh, so we don't have to do business with others um, so our money don't go outside the community. That's what the Jewish people do. That's what the Japanese people do. That's what the Chinese people Everybody do it except us, man. We're the only people that don't do it. Like when the congressmen and citizens come together, man, they come together. This person got a bill. This person got a bill. This person got a plan. This person, They got all these different plans, right? And so what, and then what they come up, they argue, and they fuss and fight. There's another thing. To come up with a good plan, you got to have a good argument. You're not going to have a good plan if it don't be scrutinized. And that's what people don't understand. If you come up with a plan, it's got to pass scrutiny. So we're not going to agree on everything. We should not agree on everything. You know what I'm saying? And so the good plan comes in with a lot of uh, scrutiny, a lot of say, hey, man, that's a good plan, but that don't benefit this group over here. Oh, that's a great idea, man, but that don't do nothing for women. Oh, that's a great idea, man, but that don't do nothing for our kids. And so then you add different parts, and they have amendments, and they change it, and then it becomes better, and then, then it gets approved, you know what I'm saying? And then it benefits everybody involved. So I just wanted to say, man, you know, yeah, we got a book as a guide, but at the same time, man, we got some real pressing issues going on and really, like Yahshua, what did he do? He went around feeding people, man. He ain't going around walking around with a book quoting verses, man. He met people's needs. And that's what we got to do. And once you do that, you have a lot of followers. That's all I want to say. Brother Mercy, Brother Mercy. Still there, uh? Yeah, I'm still there. there, Brother Mercy? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm here. All right. Oh. So... One of the things I noticed just recently in the community is there was an attempt to do some things, uh, do some do some unifying, and the people that were part of the situation kind of bailed out on the situation. They agreed to do it, then they bailed out for whatever reason. And I see that happening a lot in the community, right? Things will start to get uh, plans to be put together for some type of unity or, you know, these type of economic-type situations, whatever you – whatever the, the the prescription may be. And then it falls apart due to basically a lack of like, um, and I don't want to say integrity, but a lack of, of consistency. So how do you, how do you, in your perspective, what is your suggestion for moving beyond that? Because what will happen is the plans will be laid, um, but the people won't engage or they won't stay consistently engaged. So how do we overcome that as a nation? Number one is, you, people don't understand the plan, number one, or number two, the plan don't benefit them, or they got a plan that they don't even believe in. 
Because if I got a plan that I really believe in, I'm going to be consistent to it. So these plans they're coming up with, obviously, is not. And then you got to understand, you can build, man. Yeah, you broke it out. You, you, break it out. you know what I'm saying? You got to widen your plan. You got to include the. Hey, Brother, hey, Brother Mercy, can you hear us? Yeah, I was going to say, you got to widen your plan. You got to have a plan that includes everybody, man. You can't have a plan that. Uh, it's phone, keep cutting out. You're bringing it real bad, brother. You're bringing it real bad, man. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, Brother yeah, Mercy, your phone, your phone will keep going in and out, brother. You chop it up. Yeah, you got to. Chop it again. Yeah, yeah uh, let's call back. Let's call back. Let's call back. And uh, and uh, right. yeah, yeah, work that out. We do have another caller saying about when you guys are ready. But I got up, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know what? We could take that caller if you don't mind, Cheryl. We could take it. All right, one zero two five one zero nine seven live. Uh, Shalom. Can y'all hear me? Yo, what's the word five one zero, man? That's that's uh, that's, that's five one zero. I know what that is. That's <laughs> yeah, I know that area code when I hear it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Shout uh, out to Bank. <laughs> it was what's up? What's up with it? Oh, not much. Uh, this is uh, Vince. I'm uh, trying to tap in with y'all um, about the the subject. Me and BA had a little conversation last night about it. Um, I think um, I agree with every with everything everybody's saying, and my my main thing is. Uh, is building a community, you know, trying to get back to the black wall streets and the, and the, you see, you see a lot of guys uh, trying to start their stuff like uh, Zadok and, and uh, uh, Ron uh, Devine. And uh, I mean, even IUIC, the one in Oklahoma city, man, they bought, they bought their whole little uh, community. And then now they got, you know, even the trash man is, uh, is all Israelites. So I think, I think we need to get back to that, man. Focus on, uh, and build up the, the community and, you know, become less dependent on the society because we, we see where that been taking us to. You know, we've been going downhill ever since. And, they you know, they well, give us a pacifier. Can you all hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, go ahead, Hello? brother. Go right here. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they they pacify us with all these little small gifts. But we, we know what the Bible says about gifts. You know, they destroy the heart. So we, we need to become more focused on each other, you know, uh, start showing that brotherly love, just like uh, the Christians, man. The Christians ain't got it all wrong. I don't feel they got it all wrong. You know, they, they got they got that respect level with each other and, you know, oh, love this, love this. All that love is keeping the commandments, but we don't love each other enough to even, you know, trust each other to to, you know, to build together. I think that's one of the main issues. Man, thank you, Brother Vincent. We appreciate your words. Or uh, is that was it, or did you have more? Yeah, no, that's it. Okay, well, thanks, brother. We appreciate you, man. And most high willing, man, we get to link up for the Pentecost, man, most definitely. Yeah, it's all good. Y'all have a good one. Shalom. All right, shalom, all right. Shalom, man. Hey, all right. Can I uh, I say something in regards to those two things? Yeah, go ahead, brother. Um, all right, yeah, I noticed that, uh, this is Kevin G, by the way, I noticed that um, there was two people who there, uh, I would say three people called in, right? But two of those people mainly called in because of economic, uh, for economic reasons. Like, what we were talking about was more so what was dealing with the scriptures, but they called in about the economic thing. And I wanted to address that right quick. Um, this is my advice. And anybody, if y'all care to take it, take it. If not, then you can find your own way. That's fine. Because uh, we're in America, we have an option to do that. Now, there are a couple of things that we have to get in line. If if we expect our people to get into a place where we'll be self, uh, have enough of a voice at the capital level, meaning Washington D.C., to put in instead of just the Black Caucus, uh, who, who are really there to answer any of our needs when it comes from a democratic standpoint, but more of a conservative. Uh, type of economic point of view Saying oh instead of helping us out As a people why don't you do these things Because now we're looking to benefit ourselves uh, From what we learn economically uh, 
like the, the comedian Paul Mooney says, don't give me a slice of cake, give me the recipe, right? So here's what I'm saying. I think that if this is in anybody's ears, if you have children, try to not have children out of wedlock. If you have a job, try to keep your jobs. Try to at least make more money or get somewhere that you're happy where you will have the passion to make more money. Stay in school. That's the third thing. Now, that's with the family. What that does is that's a plan to build economic growth within the family. I had a conversation with someone who is not really a part of the Israelite community in the sense that they are a believer, but I look at this person with great reverence and respect, and I don't, I'm not afraid to say his name. It's Pastor Shez Mu'amun. And we had this very important conversation when it comes to black economics, and one of the things that he realized is that uh, he found statistically that we're so quick to kick our kids out of the home, out of the nest. Now, what we must do is I think that to anybody who has the means, try to keep your kids that are 18 at home as long as possible. Have them save up for either in their 401K or have them put something away in uh, some type of savings account where it's high yield. Build the family economic there. As I said, with the previous three things that I said, keeping your job, staying in school, try not to have children out of wedlock, make it a two-parent home if you can, to the best of your ability if you can. And, of course, if you love each other and everything else is mutual, try not to kick your kids out at an early age to make them fend off for themselves because what they can do when they stay at home, they help build up the economic backbone of the family. You guys can create an account and actually build up the family's name and money, and then that way you can make business decisions from within the family that will benefit the family. And overall, if we all do this, it will actually benefit everyone else. So I know somebody was saying something like, open up our own Walmart, open up our own stores, this, that, the other. I'm telling you guys, there are those here and there who could pop up a business, get lucky, and make it. But if we don't understand building economic wealth within our family, like other people do, if we don't understand assisting one another to build economic wealth, um, helping each other build up credit scores, helping each other get better jobs and stuff like that is not going to happen. So um, we need to get that mindset and build our economic base before we launch from it. And, and that's all I wanted to say. Man, hey, I agree. Um, what you were mentioning a little earlier, uh, when it comes to the Black Caucus and Washington, D.C., uh, when it comes to politics, man, this is how I feel about it. Our people, we need to stay away from the Democrats and Republicans, man. That stuff is just so, so, it's well over. It's time for us to leave the parties alone. If we're going to do things politically, we need to be an independent party if we're going to do anything of that nature. If we're going to try to do things that direction or vote or go and do it federally or do things locally within our um, communities at home in the states we live in, we need to leave the Democrats and Republicans alone. Because as you can see, it's not working for common people, and it's most definitely not working for our people overall. Um, but anybody else want to expound on that before we go on to the next question? Uh, I would just like to add in real quick, <laughs> always buy a new car. Don't try to buy anything new. And don't try to get any more new debt. It is not worth it. Uh, this is to all my young brothers out there, too, man. If you think, man, bro, oh, my God, I wish I knew this when I was in my 20s and stuff. Do not buy anything. Don't put yourself in $40,000 in debt making payments on the car. Don't buy that car. Don't buy that Charger. Don't buy that Corvette. Do not get it. Instead, buy a used car that's at least 10 years old or so. Pay, that, pay cash for it and put the rest in the bank. Build interest for yourself. Don't go out here and try to make these big – we're not on that level. See, that's another problem. And I'm sorry to, to get uh, passionate about this, but this is bad because I'm in the process of getting, trying to get my family straight. And everything that I learned in this past couple of days, I'm thinking to myself, like, man, I want to kick myself. I want to go back in time and punch myself in the face for the wrong decisions that I made. I, when I got my first apartment at 19 – what was I, 19? Uh, I went out and I, like – I brought. Uh, uh, I was making payments. I brought a whole apartment full of furniture. I brought a car. I brought a, a wide screen TV. 
And I, I was I thought I was living a life. I was 19 years old making payments on like 20 something thousand, no more than that, like thirty, forty thousand dollars worth of debt at 19. I had mm. no savings, no assets, nothing. And here's the thing: I didn't realize that that problem until I got older. And I'm looking at interest rates. I'm looking at myself like, yo, if I put away fifteen hundred dollars a year in a in a, in a 401k high yield savings account from the age of 19 all the way up to 27 and stop putting money in, I would have had $500,000 at retirement at the age of 65. But I didn't think about that. See, we go out and we, we, don't, we don't understand the economy. So it's not, I shouldn't say that, oh, we, religion is the problem. When brothers say that, I mean no disrespect to them. They don't know what they're talking. It's not about religion. It's not about what we believe. It's none of that. It, we did have no fundamental understanding of economics, we have no fundamental understanding of finance. If we did, we would have a religious problem outside of having money in the bank. I'm telling you that right now. In mm. fact, giving to the church is actually one of the smartest decisions because at least it's tax deductible. If you were to look at when we give to a church, it actually makes more sense than paying taxes on the income. People don't really understand these things. They don't go do the numbers. I'm learning everything now, and I think that people need to get, save money, get an emergency fund up, Pay their debt now. Run from that debt like it, like nothing before. Get out of debt now. If you have ten thousand dollars in debt, pay that off. If you got something that you make a payment on, like oh the payment's only fifty dollars a month and it's three thousand dollars, you better drop like a thousand dollars a month on that thing. Get it out your name. Get your credit right. Once you do that, build up your wealth and then start making wise decisions with your money. Church ain't got nothing to do with it. It's what you know. Mm, I do agree. I do agree. Man, dude, uh, you most definitely having a powerful build right now, man. Most definitely, I do appreciate the brothers coming on here and spitting that knowledge, man, bringing it out. And, uh, Sal, we got any more callers? Yes, we do. Yep, that number is 319 Now we have one caller standing by. Uh, we have some listeners out there that are checking out the show. Again, if you have any questions, just press number one. We'll add to the conversation. Uh, before we go to that caller, I just want to throw out a quick question to y'all. Uh, of course, the title of the show is The Pros and Cons of the Israelite Movement. What do you gentlemen think about the Hebrew Israelite sovereignty movement that's uh, out there? I don't know if you guys ever heard of the Hebrew Israelite sovereignty uh, movement, uh, but I think the mighty Hebrew is spearheading this particular group or movement. Uh, have you guys ever heard of it? What do you think about that as far as our people uh, joining up together with that kind of organization? Uh, yeah, anonymous people, you want to answer? Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm going to defer this one to the other brothers first. I'll uh, okay. say this. I had I had heard I heard about that, and I think my Hebrews been rocking with that for a while. And um, I don't know, I have heard that he was doing something of that nature. I don't know the specifics, but when you say Hebrew sovereignty nation or some type of uh, conglomerate or a body that he's trying to do, you mean they're trying to, do you mean they're trying to be sovereign of the laws of the land? Yeah, I believe so. I believe, I got to do some more research myself on it, but I believe that's trying to be sovereign. I know they have a flag up uh, that's supposed to represent the Hebrew Israelites. Uh, they have a particular flag that they created. And that's supposed to be like a representative of the Hebrew Israelites. But I had to do some more research on the entire movement, but I believe so as far as the laws of the land is concerned. Yeah, um, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, I don't know the specifics, so I'm not going to say what he is doing, what he's not doing. I'm just going to speak from a general perspective. If I was doing something like that, I most definitely would make it a point to educate the people who he's trying to, who we're trying to reach out to. Educate them on the laws of the land Because this is one thing that I notice That a lot of our people Especially a lot of our people They don't know the laws of the land They And, and to be honest They're not even aware of how the economic system works You have people A lot of our people Not, not, not just our people Just people in general People who just lay, Common people People who work for a living They don't even know how the system works So education is key we have to be re-educated because currently in the state that we're in now, overall, we're in bad shape, man. People like Kevin G was talking about, mismanaging money, finances, uh, learning how to save money, um, 401K, 
These are things that we're learning now. I wish I could go back to my 20s and start my 401k. I started my 401k a couple years ago. So as you can see, uh, I will most definitely, uh, when it comes to being sovereign of the laws and land, I'm all for it. But we need to understand how that works and how to go about it. Because you can sit here and say, I'm, I'm a sovereign citizen. Okay, what does that mean? So uh, that's how I would look at it. I'm going to fall back. Anybody else want to chime on that? Uh, the Hebrew Israelite sovereignty uh, movement before we go to the next caller? I think uh, I agree with what the brother said about going with the laws of the land. Uh, I don't really know too much about it. That's something I would really have to look into it. But as far as like you know, the, the, the land and know what you can and can't do and how the system works, I, I, I agree with uh, Anonymous on that. All right, so let's go to the next caller. And that number is 9527 We have 55 minutes on the air, family. So if you're listening on social media, if you're listening on blog talk radio, you can still call in. Once again, it must be 1952762239. I believe it's Mother Mercy once again. What's up? Yeah, hey, Sal. Um, I just wanted to say the sovereign nation piece. A lot of people don't understand, and they don't understand how the United States works. Basically, what the United States is, you, basically this is how it works. You have to be a citizen of a state before you can be a citizen of the United States. This judge explained it in a court case. And see, there's a lot of people, black people don't understand. You know, we, we came in the game late, so we don't understand the rules of the game. Anytime you start a game late, the white people don't go wrote the rules in a way that, you know, that there's no way you can beat them at their own game. Let me show you what I'm talking about. you got to be a citizen of a state before you become a citizen of the United States. That's why in your passport it has your state on there and it has a citizen of the United States. There's no such thing as being a citizen of the United States only. <laughs> I hope you don't understand that. you got to be a resident of a state first, and then you could become a citizen of the United States. So that's how that works. So what the Hebrew sovereignty is, 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 is claiming is that they're nationals and not citizens of states, which means you pay – that's why you pay city tax, state tax, um, and federal tax. All of those entities are different, and they, they don't understand. You have to have all three. You have to be a citizen of a, you have to be a citizen of a state first. That's why you pay state tax. You might live in a city, so you pay city tax or you pay city or, or, or county tax. Then you got to pay federal tax because the states are under the federal government. So that's how that works. But you have to go through one um, vehicle to get to the other. You can't just skip one stage and go to the other. So then we're called African Americans. That's why we can't be nationals because they call us African Americans. Africa is not a nation; it's a continent. So therefore, it's not a na- it's not a nation. So it's not national. See, they they don't got us by calling us African Americans. They got us because by calling us African American, that's a continent. That's not a nation. <laughs> so we can't be. National or national because we're African. Africa is a continent, not a nation. So if you tried to go home, you couldn't because Africa it has 50 different nations in it. So how do you go home? That's like saying I'm going home to the United States. Where are you going home to? Every state got different laws. So in that saying, and the way the Hebrew national stand, they think all 50 states are, are nations, which they're not. They're states, and there's one nation. So I just wanted to say that it's just a, come from a, a misunderstanding of the law, not understanding that you have to play the game by the white man's rules. And his rule is you got to be a citizen of the state before you become a citizen of the nation, which kind of makes sense. If you really, really think about it, you became a citizen. You got your state ID before you got your passport. That's usually how it works. You move up the ladder. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, can I, can I add something to that right quick, if you don't mind? Um, yeah, go ahead. You go right ahead, Art. <laughs> This is this is what I got to say with those people who be pointing that out. When you talk about the Bible and spirituality and how we have to get our people right morally, and then they come out with economics and becoming a nation and this, that, and the other, just stick the facts in their face, and I guarantee they always step down. I, I never had somebody retaliate against me with those facts. I, I will ask them. I will say, okay, do we uphold education as a primary uh, thing in our households in general? No, we do not. Do we uphold financial education as a primary uh, 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 objective in our families? 
No, we do not. We don't hold neither one of those things together. We don't, we don't really teach our kids about a checking account. We don't teach them about savings. We don't teach them about retirement. We don't teach them about trading. We don't teach them about uh, 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 the, um, the economy. We don't teach them about supply and demand. We don't make education a foundational uh, thing in the household. Like there was a question that was asked to a Jew named Ben Shapiro who works for a, uh, a, a, a Republican college. They asked him, and the dude was a Jew. He asked uh, Ben Shapiro, who is a Jew, he says, why is it, he said, I know I'm a Jew, but he says, but can you tell me why is it that Jews are so successful? Why is it that we've become doctors, become lawyers, we've become this and that? He says, well, it's really quite simple. We teach kids about money, and we hold education as a very important thing. You do not exist in this family unless you uphold education. There was a documentary on NBC, and the Asians were asked, why is it that they're so good at SAT scores and education and everything else? And they said, because back at home, even within our Buddhist religion, education is held up to a high standard. Now, what African American? I'm being real. I'm from Trenton. I'm from the, I'm from the, uh, the hood, believe it or not. Trenton, New Jersey. You cannot walk up into the library or any type of community and walk up inside the house and say, hey, do you make how many hours a day do you make your children study? They, they won't be able to tell you nothing. Any of y'all, and I would say probably some of y'all, maybe a little bit of y'all, could walk up in your old neighborhood and find a place where kids will be in the book for hours. Anybody can answer me right now. Can you go to any of your homes or any of your neighborhoods where you grew up and find where they're learning about money and they're studying for hours and their parents are strict about education? Do you see that? Negative. And, I, and, see, and, and, and seeing that I'm not getting any answer, I do not want to hear anybody, no disrespect to them, to say anything about, oh, we blame the Bible, or oh, we blame church, or oh, we blame this. And then you ask them, how many hours a night do you make your child study? If they cannot give you an answer, tell them to shut up. Because well, I want to say my one personal too. house, I was going to say in terms of my personal household, yeah, I mean, that's stressed in my house. But you asked in terms of going back to our old neighborhood. Like, nah, I can't. I'm I'm straight out of this in California. Like, that's not that's not happening where I'm from. Like, and, and I wonder, yeah, say, that's, that's not as common now in South Sacramento where I grew up at. It's not common. You may have some people that may do may they they may stress stress their kids to go to school and do a little extra studies and try to go to college. But all those other points you brought up, that ain't too common where I'm in my neck of the woods. Hey, can I say something real quick? What I do with, yeah, I was just going to say, in terms finish? of what I do with my children, my children, no. Especially my daughters. I mean, my son, only one, but my daughters, no. Like, I'm not, we're not having it. They know they know their regimen. They know, you know, what they have to do, and then they can have their free time. And, and we're talking about hours, you know, so I'm not going to get into how that works. But, yeah, in terms of going to see somebody else do it, nah, it's not happening. Yeah, I just wanted to say real quick that uh, if you look at it, our great colleges and universities were started back in the 1800s. If you look in the – I'm 44. You can't name a college, a great university that was started in the last 40 years. You know, and we didn't have that much money back in the 1800s. We just came out of slavery. So how is it that our great colleges come from when we didn't have a whole lot of money, but – but now we got so-called money, and, you know, we can't start nothing. You know what I'm saying? We came well, out of we really ha- slavery we really started have so universities. <laughs> right, but, but my, my, my question would be for that then is, is it the amount of what you have and no knowledge on how to use it or having very little and know how to use it? No, it goes to your point. They valued education back then. Right, they valued it. They didn't have a lot of money. They just valued education. Right. I know. I was adding on to that. I was saying that back then we were more aware of what was going on. Like, I, I, I mean, if you picking cotton for like a hundred, two hundred years, yo, you know the value of cotton. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know the value of what you're working on and what you're picking and what you're doing all the time. Um. 
But, like, nowadays, it's like we don't really understand it. But here's something that, that occurred to me one time, and a, and, a, and a white dude had to break this down to me. He said, uh, do you think that white people cared about slavery back then? And I said, well, I don't know. They had the abolitionist movement, this, that, and the other. So I think that some probably did and some didn't. And he says, uh, if you were back in those days, would you care about slavery? And I kind of took that offense if I was like, yeah, I would. I mean, it's my people. He says, uh, what was so bad about slavery? And I said, well, you forcing people to make goods and this, that, and the other. I said, now, he said, if you were a man, a white man in the, in the North, and you had a jacket, and you wore that jacket, would you feel bad about the blacks in the South? I said, I don't know. I said, I probably would, probably wouldn't. And he says, uh, now, let me ask you a question. He said, have you ever bought a pair of shorts or Jordans or Nike? And uh, I said, yeah. He says, what conditions do you think they, those were made under? And that really made me think. Like, you got kids in China working under harsh conditions, making the clothes we wear now. So are we really offended by slavery? Are we? What was the last question you just said, Ark? Okay. He asked, was we offended by slavery? Because we support... support Were we offended by slavery? Well, because we support brands like Jordan... Go ahead, Kevin G. My bad. Uh, no, nah, I'm saying all the clothes that you wear now are made by a, a, a harsh servitude. The clothes that you wear right now, the polo, everything, has been made in Taiwan. It's been sold uh, together in Southeast Asia. They're not treating those workers right. They're living under serv- slavery, too. Mm. So our, our view of slavery is that we think we understand the, the, the economic impact, but we 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 indulging in it now. Mm. I would say I agree to a certain extent. I would say I agree to a certain extent. Like I agree that they are working under horrific conditions. I just it's hard for me to compare it to slavery when we was stolen from a place and brought to another place to to be. Uh, to just be chattel slavery, but in terms of the wage and and how how they still live in poverty and how we are thriving off of the the goods that they make, I one hundred percent agree with those with those aspects. But then the question becomes, what other options do we have? Um, like for me, I do the best I can to you know to to be very cognizant of the things that I buy, right? I try to do black owned. I try to um, stay away from the Jordans and all of these things, right? But I'm one person, but also what are the options? I mean, it's not, you know, but one of the points that Brother Mercy brought up is there's no black-owned Walmart. There's no uh, there's no place that I can go conveniently to buy these things. So right now, what are the alternatives? What do I tell people? You know, I try to get people to shop at the, like the local mom and pops that are black owned that I go to, but you know, I'm only like, people don't they listen and they don't listen. They're gonna do it. They're gonna do what's convenient for them. So, what are the what are the alternatives? <clears throat> I mean, I would say that for people who we did not like slavery, we didn't like what we were put through. We understand it firsthand, being two, three generations in, like how that was for us. So I'm not into clothes and products and stuff like that. Like I'm into computers and all that. But if somebody was into clothes and stuff, maybe they can make up products by African Americans saying, buy our products because you don't want it from servitude. We came from that and we don't want to go back to that. So if they get involved and do that, that will be nice. I agree with you, and I think there are some people that do it. But then it sounds like you you understand how business and and commerce works. What happens is a lot of these companies are small-owned companies, especially with clothing companies. So then their overhead is so high, so then now they have to – the prices on their clothes are so high. So then it's hard for them to attract consistent consumers because the price is so high. You see what I'm saying? So that's what I'm saying. Like, what? How do we – how do we overcome all of these hurdles all at once? 
Yeah, stand by, everybody. Stand by. Kevin G. Cole actually just dropped. But we have two more callers standing by. Who can I? Anything you want to say before we go to the next caller? Yeah, who can I? Are you there? All right. <laughs> we'll get back to that. Before, but before we go to those callers, I know, mm-hmm. I know the conversation took a turn. And it, I mean, because it's kind of dealing with the same. It, even though we were talking about the pros and cons of being a Hebrew, it kind of went to our people overall. So I think this is one of the cons, though. I, just so you know, I think this this falls under the cons. What we're talking about. Oh yeah, most most definitely. You know what I'm saying? And there was one question I wanted to bring out. It wasn't necessarily talking about what we were just building on, because I most definitely uh, like what we were talking about, because it was going in a good direction. Uh, but one one thing I want to pose as Hebrews, when it comes to, and I want to bring it back to the word, <laughs> if y'all don't mind, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I see something that uh, we most definitely have to talk about. And um, one thing I would say, why is there more sword swinging and less evangelizing when it comes to being a Hebrew? Why is it that as Hebrews we're known to always take heads off other than bring people in to the fold and walk the narrow path that cross that Christ walked? Mm. Man, that's a that's a real good question. Is your hookah on there? Yeah, your hookah on is on the line, seven oh six right there, brother. You hookah on, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you guys on me probably taking care of something. But uh, I need to okay. back, I guess. But I got it. I'll just answer, answer you. Answer. I'll answer real quick. And, um, uh, it, look, I, it all goes back to the trauma, man. Um, there, There is nothing, like, let's be honest, right? When you When you come into this, there's nothing or nobody to really teach you what it is you're supposed to be doing. You talked about this. Comparing it to Christendom, at least in Christendom, you go to seminary school or you, you know, you you on trial at a church for a little while. You're a deacon or you, or, you know, and then next thing you know, you're preaching and you're doing all of this other stuff. Um, when you come into this, you're just a free agent, right? So it's nothing set in stone to show you what you're supposed to do. So what do you do? You keep engaging on the internet. You watch on the internet, and then the next thing you know. Well, everybody else swinging a sword, so I got to swing the sword to show that I'm engaged in my culture. And there are there are Hebrews that do videos that just that just strictly try to teach. Um, and I, I know the the camps are doing their version of evangelizing. So I don't want to say nobody's evangelizing, evangelizing, but as a whole, why is there not enough evangelizing? Because there's think about it like this, right? It's just as as when, as people that are waking up, and some of us been in this 30, some people been in this 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? Um, but even with that, there's still nothing set up, an established base set up overall as a whole to where the, the Israelite waking up in New Jersey can learn the, something similar to what the Israelite waking up in Oakland is learning. And then take that out and evangelize to the world. It's only let's keep it in house. And then also, there's a little bit of shame involved in this too, right? Because a lot of people don't agree with the street camps, right? With the camps on the corner, especially the the a lot of the different doctrines taught in the camps. So then it becomes one of these things where, like, I don't even know, if, especially if I'm new to this and I don't understand and I'm still growing. I don't even know how or what to evangelize, right? So for me, it, it all stems back to we have to create some form of leadership to give people guidance. Like there's no guidance. There's nothing. There's no rules to this right now. It's a hen house. Right. It's, it's crazy. Like it's literally no rules to this. And so um, go ahead. I'm sorry, bro. Finish up. My fault. No, I'm just if if we're not if we're serious about this, all of us as as educated men, men that are coming in here trying to make a difference, at some point in time we got to say, okay, enough is enough. Push the brakes on all this. 
Like, if you're making videos and you out here acting crazy, we don't want to hear nothing from nobody until we set up some form of cohesive leadership. Otherwise, you're just going to keep seeing group after group pop up in this faction versus that faction, this person versus that person, and uh, and, and eventually it just becomes self-destructive. And that's what we are right now is self-destructive because there is nothing, no one grabbing it by the horn and saying, okay, this is my nation. I'm ready for my nation to to get right. And I know that some of us are doing that behind the scenes. But we have to do it. If we, if we, the people that we're talking to, that we're working with, we have to do it. If we're not going to do it, we're just going to keep saying it. Go ahead. Huh? Okay. Uh, you brought out some key points. Uh, um, but there's a lack of unity. Uh, every time a few brothers and sisters try to come together with a few things, it seems like it, it, it gets a good push or it gets a good start, then eventually there's no commitment. Uh, it seems like what I what I what I'm starting to understand or what I'm starting to realize is that I I I'm noticing that we have brothers and sisters in this community who are just hell bent on their public prestige, on their image, on how they look. And you see these different individuals set hopping from this group to this group to this group trying to get in where they fit in. Yeah. This yeah. is what I see. I, I don't see it's like being a Hebrew is the is the new century version of a of a game banger. That's what it is. It's too much of the affiliations with this group and that group and that group and this group. Well, I'm over here, but I'm not over here, but I'm back over here, but I'm up here, I'm down there, I'm up north, I'm up south, I'm east, I'm west. And there's no order. And one thing we talked about behind the scenes, Anonymous, is that where are our elders? Um, you have certain camps that, 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 that uh, the elders are, they have some type of control or they have some type of order, but then you have a lot of these other camps, there's no kind of eldership nowhere to be found. Right. Not at all, because everybody in Israel feels like they don't want to be under somebody. Uh, look at look at Christ. Christ, before he spoke, he spoke at the age, it says in the book, it said he was about 29 going on 30, somewhere around there. And he, he he taught for about three and a half years. All that time, from from a child all the way up to his 30s, he was getting in some studying. He was meditating, praying, fasting. All those years of getting all that, soaking up all this, getting the spirit, getting that influence of the Father. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, Luke chapter 4. You see that it took time for him. Um, before he started speaking, he knew who he was, but he didn't get haughty. He didn't get cocky. He didn't get arrogant. He was humble. He didn't have to get up and announce himself all the time. His spirit, his aura, his character just picked up when you saw him. You knew who he was, rather you loved him or you hated him. So when he began to speak, he spoke for three and a half years, and that was perhaps one of the most powerful three and a half years that that people have experienced on this earth, recorded in history. This man came out of nowhere and influenced a lot of people up to this day. And and we are and a lot of people are divided over Christ. They don't believe who he is and you have people who do believe who believe in who he is. So, as you can see, when it comes back to us as Hebrews, there is a lack of humility. There's a lack of being humble. Because being a Hebrew is the new facade. It's all about being Negro, and this is the thing. I don't see Hebrews online. I see Negroes wearing fringes and head coverings. <laughs> That's what I see. A Hebrew is supposed to be set apart. He's supposed to. What does it mean? Um, I breathe a Hebrew word. It means he that who crossed, who crossed over. Yeah, who crossed over. Like, what do you cross over to? But the common, the norm now of being a Hebrew. That's looked at more so of an ethnicity type thing. Oh, I'm a Hebrew. So I'm sitting up here like the people, the ancients, they had a deeper understanding of what it meant to be a Hebrew. 
It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't anything that was going around playing with. It was serious. Look at look at Abraham. Look at Isaac. Look at Jacob. These individuals were men of integrity. Look at Moses. Look at the prophet Elijah. Look at uh, the prophet Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, King David, King Solomon. These were individuals who understood the force and the God that they served. They understood that he was a God of integrity, and he expected his representatives to act with some integrity, to act with some, um, to be cordial, to, 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 to have some respect. And as you can see, being a Hebrew nowadays, it's a joke. This is what I'm seeing. It's either we're arguing more, we're beefing, our light is being shunned. It ain't shining. We're shunning our light, and we're doing more damage turning people away. That's what, we t- that's what I see now. Let me say this part, Ock. Go ahead. I would say everything that you said is powerful, and I agree with it. I think Brother Mercy brought up a, a good point when he was speaking earlier. Um, people are not personally invested, right? Um, we, and I say we that are engaged in this community, have got to figure out a way to sit down and create avenues and create outlets for people that they can personally be involved, right? We need to create something for our sisters. We need to create something for our young men and our young women. We need to create something for our singles, right? We get, I mean, we all of these things are true needs in the community. We need to create some type of financial education, financial literacy type situation, some type of uh, mental counseling situation, right? These are all the solutions that we need to work on, and we need to reach out to our elders, um, even reach out to, you know, um, some of the new people and try to bridge the gap and see what we can come up with. Because if, if like I said, we don't, we're going to just stay in this perpetual cycle. Uh, and now we have to create things. So if people are listening and you have some ideas, Email us the, uh, these ideas, right? Send, um, we don't just hand out our information for no reason. Send us the ideas. Tell us the things that you think we need, and we will start to reach out to the other people that are influential in the community, and we will try to create these things. We will try to set these, these, these avenues up. Um, that, for me, is the biggest con in this community, community uh, just a lack of leadership, but cohesive, functional leadership that says, okay, here's the needs, here's what the people are asking for, let's go out here and put this together for them. Um, and I, it starts with people like you and I, I guess. You know, we have to reach out to everybody that we can reach out to and say, hey, let's, you know, how do we uh, achieve these these various uh, platforms or various roads of, of um uh, that's what I'm looking for. Progression. How do we achieve progression? And here, here's what the people are emailing us. Here's what we see the needs are. And then go ahead and implement them. And then finally, those that want to engage and that are personally invested, cool, let's invest in them. But we, we also kind of just, those that don't want to invest or those that want to just cause division and schism, we kind of got to point these people out. Right to the community. That, that's where I see we are right at this point. We have to point out the troublemakers and not uh, isolate them or kick them out, but let's put some peer pressure on them and tell them, okay, enough is enough. You know, uh, if we are the wiser nation, which I believe we are, then we really have to do these things. Otherwise, it stays the same. Yeah, we most definitely got to get rid of the attention horse. That's just what it is. <laughs> we we, we got to get rid of them, and we or or at least put them in check, and and tame them. And that's not a shot at no one in in particular. I'm talking about in every community you have them. The Christians have them. This different set has them, and various other denominations has them. We got to get rid of the troublemakers. We got to get rid of the guys who are infatuated with what they see and what they hear, and looking good on the internet. We have to most definitely re- redefine what it means to be a Hebrew Israelite. We have to most definitely change the negative image that goes with it. That's why we got so many enemies against Israel. The reason why there's such an uproar against Israel nowadays is because what we have done, how we carried ourselves, how we how we conducted ourselves. Just look. 
When you have individuals who go around saying on the street corners, we're going to rape little girls and all this other, yeah. all these vow comments that we hear from some of these guys who preach, who teach, and say these evil things. They, they say these things unchecked. No one's checking them. They're just continuously going out here saying the same crazy madness. And you see uh, the approach of other other belief sets. You see why they come in here and they're and they're running rapid and they're doing whatever they want to and they're and we're getting treated the way we're getting treated because we are not correcting the madness that's being taught that's coming out of Israel. Uh, there's various camps who teach doctrines that are that are crazy. And you know how other and you know other Israelite camps or other, or other brothers and other sisters were like, well, they're not talking about me. They don't represent me. Yes, they do. They call themselves a Hebrew. Aren't you a Hebrew? Is it your job to correct your brother and sister to show that you love them? Brother B A going in right now. Yo, this is what I would say in terms of that. We're not gonna change what these camps teach. All right, we we just we not we can put pressure on them, but. We're not going to influence them. What we can do is create a unity base of like-minded believers that that are really the core um, representatives of what the Most High has prescribed for us to do. Right. I, and that's I true. don't see us being able to. I don't see us being able to change. And I'm not going to say no specific camp's name. I, I don't see us being able to influence these brothers. Especially when uh, a certain camp is saying, um, for lack of better terms, we know more than you, and uh, anything you say outside of this, we're not hearing it. I'll just put it out there like that. Um, we not You're not going to change that mindset, but what you can do is go out and grab the Brother Mercies and the Brother Vinny, like the brother that called in tonight, uh, the Kevin G's and the Brother Divine's, and and really sit down and create some things that can be influential and have an immediate impact in a community. Um, you know, we just we've been having powerful bills after powerful bills with all of these different brothers. It's time for us to reach out to them. That's that's the only thing I see now. It's really time to reach out to them and say, "How here's what we need to do. We want to get rid of the pros and the cons. Uh, we want to get rid of the cons and just have nothing but pros." Um, let's get together. Here's your expertise. Here's your expertise. Let's make this thing uh, a congruent, a congruent push. And other than that, there's no other way. I don't. I don't. I just don't see us being able to stop what a, what a camp is teaching. Right? They have. Oh yeah, I do much, understand they're that. Too isolated. They too isolated. Yeah. Right? They they've already created their own little nest, so they're gonna stay in their little bubble. Oh yeah, most take definitely. Some out. Hello? Yes, yeah, I again. Mean, check some callers? Mm-hmm. Yeah, BA, you for the calls? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, um, yeah, we can go to the callers. All right, we have like a few minutes left, so let's go to the phone line. Let's go to 469-245, the last. Call of four six nine. Four oh, six sorry. nine two four five. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. This is uh Shikatiba and I just wanted to call in and I um wanted to support and I love what I heard so far. Um I did I was taking notes as you guys were talking because um, you know, I can go on and on but <laughs> um I heard about one is and it's like Hebrew versus uh, Christians, um, and so certain things from our conversation last night, or was it the night before, it was we were talking to a Christian group, and they were arguing something that they felt that all Hebrew Israelites believed or Israelites believed, and I was like, this is not even a contention. We have the same doctrinal differences in our community that you have in yours. So this was not even a matter of contention or conversation. Why are we talking about it? Thank you, honey. I'm sorry. My daughter calls me about my first name. Uh, (laughs) Working on that. Also, commitment 
um, as far as uh, uh, scripture, scripture supported um, as a whole, uh, we have different different things that we say are scripturally supported, and and different interpretations on that as well. However, we can come together to fellowship. We can come together to greet one another. We can come together to uh, let our light shine as far as relationship. And unfortunately, we don't do that. Also, uh, as far as elders, you Daddy. know, in the female either uh, elder Daddy. realm. I'm sorry, y'all. In the female. Hold on for this. Love the kids. <laughs> is that is that uh is that chic? <laughs> yes, it's Eva. She's acting up. She don't want to. She don't want me to read her a thing. I'm sorry, y'all. No, it's all it's all it's all good, chic. It's all good. It's all, good. all right. Just a moment. I'm sorry. All right, I guess she uh, muted herself. Uh, let's go to the next caller. Then. Let's go to five one zero nine one seven. You're live. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm back, man. I just y'all was just touching on some stuff, and it kind of resonated. And uh, I I think the pros and the cons is like um, is pride. Like when you when you when you first get into it, it's, you know, you find out you're Israel and. You know, you, you're real happy, and, you know, so you your, your stuff get all pumped up, and you feel like you got to, you know, go at all the false doctrines, and you try, and, and you don't know how to pick and choose your battles. And uh, I, I think, uh, especially when it gets, a, when you get into, when you get more years, it's like you get, it's, it's like that pride starts setting in, and then it's like nobody can correct you. Nobody wants to hear anything, and next thing you know, you got all these different doctrines, you know. Like uh, you, you get into a, a, a place and you got an elder. The elder says something that offends you, and then, you know what I'm saying, you just you splinter off and you go create your own thing and you start teaching your own thing. So I, I don't know, man. It's, it's hard, man, because I, I think if we, if we just follow the commandments, then like 100% of our problems will just be alleviated. You know what I'm saying? Like just loving your brother, hear out the hear out the situation. If you don't agree with it, you don't agree with it. You say what you you say your piece, but let it be it. But come together, keep those commandments, man, and just live together, and then just build your foundation. I mean, that's your foundation. You got to build off that foundation. Do that, man. We we can start flying, you know, because it. it, it I mean, it's what it's economic. You know, it teaches you all about economics, and it teaches you about communal relations, you know. And it, it's just hard, man, because the pros and the cons is like, it, it's just like Christianity, man. you got so many different sects, you know what I'm saying? And everybody got their own different beliefs, and it's hard to see because you only got one book, or you got a lot of different books compiled into one, but it's the same information. But everybody fighting over the interpretation of that information, you know, when it all boils down to the Torah, because all the the New Testament, so-called New Testament, the Old Testament, is all based on Torah. So if everybody just went back to Torah, then all the examples, you know, are there to enforce Torah, you know. And it's just, it, I don't know, I find it weird, man. Everybody everybody got their own thing. And, it's, and it's, it ain't nothing new under the sun because they've been doing this since, you know, since day one. You know, everybody got their own thing. Everybody's clicking up, Israel fighting uh, Judah, you know, and it's, it's all bad, man. It's, I don't know if we'll ever get past that because I think that we, um, it's like, he gave us up to our own vile, our own vile sections, and he ain't even talking to us no more. So we kind of got, we got to, we got to, what we got to do is we got to swallow that pride and then repent and really get back to doing, doing this thing like Hosea said, you know, and then he'll turn his face back to us, you know. 
that's what I think. The pros and the cons. That's that's a that's a real good question. And y'all y'all hit it y'all hit it pretty hard. And I just wanted to expound on a little bit of what I heard. Hey Shalom, Mark. We appreciate you. Uh, you know what I'm saying for, for for reaching out and calling in. And uh, I definitely agree with what you're saying. I will just say this part, and I'll let Brother B.A. Um, say his piece. There's more for us than there are against us, right? Um, while right now it may seem um, like, it, like, oh, man, it's just horrible, I'm hearing more and more brothers talk like you, right? I, I get to hear more and more brothers on a, on a weekly basis that are conscious of what's going on on both sides, uh, what we call uh, Tanakh or Torah only, as well as uh, those that that believe in the New Testament Messiah. Um, we we are all waking up to what's to the damages and to the bad stuff that's in our community. So I do think it's possible to move forward. It's going to take some of us just uh, really being dedicated to saying, okay, enough is enough. And even if that means um, we have to move aside, not so much go without the elders' help, but get the elders' advice and then actually go out and do the work. Because I know a lot of our elders are tired of the fighting. They're tired of it. They're just, they're, yep. okay, well, if y'all just going to keep fighting. Y'all just sit there and be ignorant and fight. I'm going to keep teaching. That's the way the elders feel at this point. So, you know. As the as the young people that's out here working, we just have to say enough is enough. And those that don't want to unite and don't want to uh, support and do the right things, we kind of just have to leave them off to the side and tell everybody else like that's dirty money, right? That we just we don't we don't touch that, right? That's that's the, that's a wash over there, and then everything else mm-hmm. that we're really trying to put together, we build. Right, that's that's our only option at this point. If we're trying to unify the stick, if we're trying to take Judah and Israel and really unify it, that's the only option. So I, I think you brought some excellent points, and we do. So you know, we we build with you, we build with everybody we can build with that's of like minds now, and we uh, we move forward. Yeah, I I don't I, just to say one thing. I don't I don't want it to seem like I'm down and I feel like it's it's all bad, you know, because I don't think it's all bad. You know, I still feel good because people are starting to come, even if they don't believe, you know, in everything that the Bible say, you know, people are starting to come out and they're starting to come out of that nonsense that they was in. They might be falling into some other nonsense, but it seemed like the the steps, like you said, the steps is getting closer and closer to that main. But and then also what you you said uh, something else and I forgot what you said. Oh man! But it it, it resonated with me, and it, you know it's the truth, man. We you know we got to oh accountability, man. We got to start. We got to UMBA. We got to start holding people accountable for what they say and what they do, because uh, what what it say is say uh, if you got you know in a body. If you got one part that's ailing, you know what I'm saying. Right. Everybody's supposed to right. come and help that 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 uh, ail that that sore part pick it up, help yeah. it up. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. And then it's not just yeah. that; it's the people that need the help. They have to realize they need the help so that they'll allow the other people to help them. You know what I'm saying. <clears throat> so that that's one of the big things we got to do. And I'm you know and I'm all for it. Like. I'm out, we out here, we got a small little business, we paint houses, but it's our own thing. You know what I'm saying? So if y'all, if, if anybody want to connect, you know what I'm saying? I, well, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm all for like, uh, like everybody piecing up, like, the, I mean, going back to the body, you know, you can't have all heads in one body. You can't have all feet. So otherwise the body ain't going to function properly. So, I'll come. I can. I can come, and I can do my part. If anybody needs some work done, and they got, you know, if they if they ain't really got the money or nothing like that, you know what I'm saying? We all got to just come together, and follow. You know, those commandments teach that come together, uh, help each other out, and then you know it'll eventually come back to you. Eventually, you know, trade and barter. You know what I'm saying? We we got Man. so whacked out. Everybody telling us how to move. Now we moving right. they to their movement, 
And, you know, we, we tripping and falling over our own feet because we ain't supposed to be moving like them. We're supposed to be set apart and doing our own thing. So I think I think the pros would be, you know, knowing that you're Israel, knowing that, knowing that, uh, knowing that you got some special kind of favor, even though it ain't like you're supposed to cut everybody else out because we're supposed to be the light to the other people. But you know that it's there, but the cons is like we got to shake that pride. You know what I'm saying? Like we're supposed to be the light, and the light shines. How can it shine if you throw in the shade over it and just keep it in your little circle? You know what I'm saying? Once people see our light shining, I think everybody will start getting on board whether they believe the commandments or not. You know what I'm saying? Because they'll, they'll start eventually just doing the commandments because that's what we're doing because we're trendsetters. We set trends, not to brag or boast or nothing like that, but, man, uh, people we set trends. You know what I'm saying? And people do tend to follow you, you know? And I, one that comes to mind is saggy pants. I know they ain't no good trend, right. but right. you got a whole whole bunch of cats out here looking stupid, you know what I'm saying, with their pants down to their ankles, you know, just so they could show that they boxers match with they, uh, with they, with they kicks or whatever, you know what I'm saying? But, but we set trends, man. So let's, we got we to gotta be the trendsetters and let our light shine. And I think once our light starts shining, we don't even need to tell people to keep the laws because they're going to be fishing, trying to figure out what it is we're doing to get our light to shine so bright. You know what I'm saying? And I think that take that, that foundation is that, is, that, is that Torah, and then everything else falls around that because then we'll, we'll know how to love our brother and we'll know how to love our, our, uh, our, our father. You know what I mean? That's all. That's all I want to say. But but y'all brothers is doing a, a whole. I love these discussions. Uh, I like the debates. You know what I'm saying because they're entertaining. But these discussions, man, it, I I get edified on these discussions because they make you think. You know what I mean. So I appreciate y'all brothers. I appreciate you, Sal, and uh, y'all brothers, man. Y'all keep on doing it, and uh, hopefully we all get the bill uh, one day. And uh, that's about it. Most deaf brothers. Appreciate you. All right. All right. Yeah, man. Uh, we got nine minutes left on the air. We got nine minutes left. It's about winding down. Uh, I guess we'll just go for closing statements. But before we get to the closing statements, I'd like to thank uh, Kevin G and Brother Yohokan. They, they, they had to fall back. We appreciate those brothers taking the time out their busy schedule to come build with us. Uh, most definitely with um and then thanks Sal for uh, for for, for uh, just being a, a big brother in the faith and looking out and allowing us to come on here. Uh, thank Anonymous Hebrew uh, for just uh, being a brother in the faith as well. And then thank the brother Vinny D for calling in and expounding. And thank all who called in. We appreciate it. And uh, so Anonymous, you want to close out real quick, and then I'll fall back after you. Well, I will. I'll fall back after you. I'll finish up after you, rather. <laughs> Hello? Hey, you there? I'm, and I'm sitting here talking. I'm talking. I'm talking. I'm on mute. My bad. <laughs> yeah, just, um, you know, shalom to the family, man. All praises to the most high. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will just, um, I love these conversations, man, because they, they show, one, where the men are. They show where we are. And then now we got some sisters calling in. Well, we always got a couple sisters calling in. So, you know, I would like to hope that these things are starting now to to make people's wheels turn and, and cause people to want to get engaged and to actually uh, create and, 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 and give your thought process on what we need. And then all of us humble ourselves, go back and pray, and let the Most High lead us in the directions that He wants us to go in. So uh, I thought tonight was a beautiful build. I want to thank the two brothers, Kevin G and Brother Yohanan, for coming out, joining us on the conversation. Always, always much love to my brother BA. Now that's my brother right there. If y'all don't know, that's my brother. And then my brother Sal, that's my brother. Like I really talk to these dudes every day. So uh, it's a whole new. Uh, brotherhood that we have really built and I'm appreciative and I thank the most high for that and I would love to see that uh, permeate into our community so 
Um, I love y'all. Uh, keep working, Israel. Don't get discouraged. We can do this. We just gotta. We just gotta stay the course. So, uh, so long to my family, and uh, I'm out. Yo, thank you, Anonymous. Appreciate it. Praise the Most High God in the name of His holy, anointed, and only messenger known as Yeshua the Christ. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out, listening, for those uh, who are going to be, who listen live, on the phone, and even we, we thank those who are listening on the YouTube upload. <laughs> we, we appreciate everybody for taking the time out. Thank you again. Thank you again once, uh, I mean, thank you again, Sal. Man, I'm getting tongue-tied this evening. My goodness gracious. Uh, and most definitely, a message to Israel, I will say this before we close out, is that be mindful when you're out publicly. Be mindful how you speak. Be mindful how you act. Please, because we represent the Most High. And if we continue to act crazy, if we continue to be drama kings and queens, we're doing a lot more damage than good. Think about it. Pray on it. And with that being said, Sal, take it away. <laughs>